you all to the second day of the international web lecture series hosted by Department of English, Bakura Christian College. Warm greetings and welcome to all the dignitaries, faculty members, research scholars, eminent personalities, students, each and everyone present on this virtual platform, either the Google Meet Forum or over YouTube. We are really honored today that we are having among us two eminent speakers, Professor G.B. Sural sir, Professor of English, Bakura University, and Dr. Shukriti Ghoshal sir, Principal, MUC Women's College, Badwan. Before I request Professor G.B. Sural sir to go ahead with his deliberation, may I request Professor Shivajati Karmukar sir, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Bakura Christian College, to formally introduce him. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Riyanka. I feel privileged to introduce my teacher, Professor Gautam Buddha Sural, Professor, Department of English, Bakura University, who has been in teaching since 1990. He started his career as a teacher in Bakura Christian College in the Department of English. He went to Bristol University, UK in 2006 as a visiting fellow. In 2008, he joined the Department of English, Vidyasagar University, Midnapur as a professor. A year later, in 2009, he came back to his old college and continued to teach there until July 2015. He is the author of a book, Hopkins and pre rapidism and has edited four books on tribal life. He has presented papers in various conferences and seminars, and a number of his papers have been published in different national and international journals and books. His area of interest is Victorian poetry, Indian English literature, and tribal and Dalit studies. Today, Professor Sural will talk on Kamala Das's poetry, and I'm sure his lecture will provide us with illuminating insights on Kamala Das. Now, I request Professor Gautam Buddha Sural, sir, to go ahead with his deliberation. Sir, please. Thank you, Shivajyoti. And uh, let me thank uh, the entire department because I still consider it as my department. Uh, Shivajyoti has introduced me and he has mentioned that I have taught there for a long 25 years, starting from 1990 to 2015. And uh, my association with the college, I uh, sorry for being personal, but then uh, just a mention of it, uh, because it started not with me, but with my father. My father served this institution for long 42 years in different capacities. And then I was a student of this college and uh, I taught there after joining 1990 for, as I've said, a long 25 years. So every time, whether I come virtually or whether I physically go there, it's a homecoming for me. So thank you to the authority, uh, respected principal, Dr. Mondol, with whom I also worked for many years. And with a thank you to all the participants who are on the other side, I intend to begin my talk today. Uh, as Sivakuti has already mentioned, that uh, uh, I will be talking on Kamala Das, and uh, I have my PPT. Uh, I will be presenting that. Uh, <clears throat> just give me a minute so that I can set it. Yes, one minute.
You take your time, sir. No issue. Yes, yes, yes. Just one minute. <coughs> Can you can you see the uh, on screen the title? I mean, sir. Can you see that? Hello. Yes. Sir. Yes, you can see that. Okay. It's okay. visible now. Okay. 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 So uh, this is the title. Uh, Beyond the personal, the collective consciousness in Kamla Dash's poetry. Now. Uh, before I enter into the presentation of the paper proper, uh, let me talk about the structure that I have meant. Actually, I have divided my talk today into uh, three parts. In the first part, uh, I begin by pointing out uh, the difference between the confessional I, that means the I that we find in confessional poetry, and the I, which we find generally in lyric poems or lyric poetry. And then I will briefly focus on the critical reception of Kamla Das as a confessional poet. In the second part, through an analysis of some select poems, and I have selected mainly poems which talk of uh, conjugal love or uh, the dissatisfaction of conjugal love, whatever. So in the second part, through an analysis of some select poems, I would try to ascertain the confessional nature of her poems. And at the same time, I will also like to show that uh, these poems, which are extremely personal, go beyond the personal territory and assume a universal significance. In the third or last part, I would try to address the controversy regarding the fidelity or the faithfulness of the experiences that she describes in her poems. Side by side, I would also try to reconcile the person and the person, meaning the person who is behind the creation in Kamala Dash's poetry. The Controversy, actually, that is what I will be talking in the third part. The controversy actually further proves that her poems go beyond the personal level. She talks about role playing. I will be quoting her own words because I think many of you know that she talks about all these things about role playing, manipulation, using mask, and these strategies help her to masquerade her own experiences and talk on behalf of others. So this is the general structure that I have framed. And now I come to my paper. Uh, and I would like to <clears throat> begin my talk by quoting a very short anecdote from an article, lying for the sake of making poems. So it's very interesting. The title of the article is Lying for the Sake of Making Poems by an American poet, Ed Kuzer. The edited volume in which this article is included is titled After Confession, Poetry as Autobiography. Many of the contributors in this book are poets. So Kuzer begins his article thus. And I have shown it on the screen, you can read it. I once knew a husband and wife, both asp aspiring poets. He had a young son from prior marriage whose face was badly scarred. One evening, the stepmother showed me a poem in which she described her husband's first wife cutting the child in a drunken rage. Horrified, I asked, did that really happen? And she answered, 
No, it was an innocent accident. I just thought my version would make a better poem. That's what, that's how Kuza begins his paper, his article. So whether such manufactured or manipulated incidents should be used by a poet, particularly in case of confessional poetry, can always be debated. As the writer of the article has debated in his paper, he himself has debated this issue. In confessional poetry, the I or my is often understood by the readers as the real self of the poet. But in a lyric poem, the poet's use of the first person does not necessarily refer to the poet's own self. The I in such poems may be a persona other than the poet, the experience of whom the poet is writing about. In such cases, the first person pronoun transcends the personal boundary. Sometimes the I becomes a universal persona, a representative I. I'm reminded of uh, Tagore's short poem, which many of you, many of us have read. Uh, the title of the poem is The Miser, the Bengali of which is Kripon. And the poem begins with these words, I was begging from door to door. The I here is obviously not the poet, but a representative I who stands for every man. In lyric poetry or romantic poetry, this is perfectly acceptable. But the I in confessional poems is believed to be the voice of the poet who the readers expect is narrating his or her first-hand experiences. Any departure from this general norm raises questions about the nature of confessional poetry. So before uh, entering into a uh, discussion of uh, Kamala Dash's poetry in some detail, I'd like to talk briefly about the position of Kamala Dash in Indian English poetry. She is generally regarded by critics and poets as a confessional poet. In fact, she is the first woman in Indian English poetry to be labeled thus. She is also perhaps the most controversial poet whose experience as she has narrated in her poem and autobiography, often contradicts her real life incidents and happenings. We will come to that, as I have said in the later part of my talk. The first important critic, I'll be very brief here in mentioning the critics who have uh, categorized her or labeled her as uh, a confessional poet. So the first important critic to not come Ladas as a con confessional poet is K. R. Srinivas Iyengar. In the second edition of his book, Indian Writing in English, published in 1973, he places Kamla Dash in the chapter under the title, The New Poets, and observes that she is the most aggressively individualistic of the new poets. He goes on to say, I quote, there is no doubt Kamla Dash is a new phenomenon in Indo-Anglican po Anglican poetry, a far cry indeed from Tarudat or even Sorojini Naidu. Kamla Dash's is a feminine sensibility that dares without inhibitions to articulate the hearts it has received in an insensitive, largely man-made world. While acknowledging that thus is a confessional poet, Iyengar feels that the ultimate self of the poet is kept back from the readers. So my emphasis is on this particular phrase, kept back. She oftentimes keeps her back from revealing herself in her poems. This is something important. In 1981, Anisul Rahman in his book, Expressive Form in the Poetry of Kamala Dash, points out the direct and uninhibited manner of expression in Kamala Dash's poems. So you can see what uh, Iyengar says and what uh, Anishu Rahman says. Both of them agree to the point that Kamala Dash's expressions are absolutely uninhibited. So uh, Iyengar says, after regarding her as a confessional poet, I quote, 
Kamla Das, among all the poets in the confessional genre, stands in splendid isolation owing to her eminently personal note. Checking the pan-Indian feminism, she writes of her private anguish in an effortless manner. This may adequately be called her expressive form. And now I come to another important critic, Bruce King. Bruce King, in his Modern Indian Poetry in English, published in 1987, suggests that Kamala Das follows the confessional mode of writing, but he says something very interesting in that connection. He writes, the poems show that through her sexual confessions, her writing has made her a self-conscious celebrity and she plays up to it often bragging and celebrating. I have added the emphasis and you can well understand why I have emphasized, why I have put these words in italics, plays up to it often bragging and celebrating. A. N. Divedi, <clears throat> in his book, Kamla Dash and Her Poetry, published in 2000, devotes a chapter on Kamla Dash as a confessional poet. She places her in the line of American confessional poets. He analyzes a number of poems by Kamla Dash to prove that she is a, I quote unquote, a confessional poet in the truest sense of the term. Subsequently, many critics have categorized her as a confessional poet. In an anthology of aces titled Kamala Das Critical Perspectives, which was published in 2010, edited by Devendra Kohli, many contributors, they corroborate the confessional nature of Das's poetry. So after uh, this brief uh, uh, discussion on Kamala Das as a confessional poet, as she was appreciated by critics of Indian English literature, I now come to the uh, second part where I will be mainly talking about a few poems uh, related to married life, related to love in married life. Uh, of course, I begin with an introduction because I think that uh, introduction is a poem uh, which properly introduces a poet like Kamla Das and it is typically confessional in nature. So I begin by referring to composition. In her poem composition, Kamala Das writes, I must let, mine, let my mind strip tease. I must extrude autobiography. And later in the same poems, he says, I know that by confessing, by peeling off my layers, I reach closer to my soul. This is precisely what she does in a poem like an introduction. The poem is an attempt to establish her female identity against the odds that a woman often has to face in traditional patriarchal households. The dictations of the male-dominated society are a binding for a woman, and the poem is an open call to flout those injunctions. On issues like choosing a language to write, making love, wearing dresses, she prefers to be the master of herself. The assertion of the self is heard in every single line of the poem, and the first person pronoun, I, has been used. I have literally counted, and I have found that it has been used at least 28 times in the poem. In the last eight lines, the I gets drifted from the male egotistical self to the speaker to give a message to the patriarchal society, to the patriarchs, that the woman is not ready to play the second fiddle. Rather, it is an emphatic reversal of the male eye. If the male can boast of his ego, the woman also can flaunt her own identity. I go to the last part of the poem. It is I who drink lonely, drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns. It is I who love, it is I who make love and then feel shame. It is I who lie dying with a rattle in my throat. I am sinner, I am sent. I am the beloved and the betrayed. I have no joys that are not yours, no ex which are not yours. I too call myself I. So you can understand this is, if you count again, you can find that at least 10 times in these last eight lines, 
the I has been repeated. The speaker in the poem is confessional and at the same time powerfully expressive of our choices. The reader also feels that she is speaking on behalf of women in general. I'd like to focus on Kamala Das's poems, as I have said, on conjugal relationship to show that the experiences narrated in those poems are personal and yet they can be the story of any woman subjugated by the male power in day-to-day -day family life. The confessional tone in these poems is unmistakable. She was married quite early at the age of 15 to K. Madhava Das, her uncle in the Naya tradition. Her father decided to give her away in marriage because she failed in her school mathematics examination. Now, at this point, I would like to stop and point to Kamala Das's own opinions on this decision of her father, which, like many of her opinions expressed during her personal interviews at different times, contribute to her becoming a controversial figure as a confessional poet. In a book uh, titled The Love Queen of Malabar, Memoir of a Friendship with Kamala Das by Mary Lee Wisbone, the author records Kamala Das telling her that her father became furious when she could not pass in the mathematics examination. His face turned purple in anger and calling her a dunce, he shouted her, I quote, Kamala Das herself told them uh, to Mary Lee and her father, I quote, you have disgraced our illustrious family. I will not educate you father. Now it will have to be marriage. What else can I do with a girl like you? Unquote. And now these words, Kamala Das herself says, and this very Kamala Das in an interview with P.P. Ravindran said earlier, I quote now what she said to P.P. Ravindran in that interview. I never got anything beyond 20% in arithmetic. Then I stopped studying. Or rather, my father felt that I should stop studying and turn to uh, marriage and domesticity. That was a great blessing because I think education is full of things that are of no use to you in real life. Education dumps a lot of junk into the minds of people. It is difficult later to throw that junk out and become a clean person. I think I escaped all that and this definitely has helped me as a writer. So the contradiction is very obvious. What she said to Mary Lee Winsborn and what he earlier expressed to P.P. Ravindran during an interview, they contradict each other very clearly. Her uh, observation to P.P. Ravindran can very well be a commentary on the education system that we are into, but that is a different thing. Uh, so the marriage initially appeared to her as unimaginative and it meant to her a sort of loveless domesticity. There was a great age difference between Kamala and her husband. She was 15 and he was 35. In her poem, The Old Playhouse, the speaker expresses her disappointment as a wife in no uncertain manner. She says, see the lines, you dribbled spittle into my mouth, you poured yourself into every nook and cranny, you embalmed my poor lust with your bittersweet juices, you called me wife, I was taught to break saccharine into your tea and to offer at, right moment, at the right moment the vitamins. Cowering beneath your monstrous ego, I ate the magic loaf and became a dwarf. I lost my will and reason. So the speaker entered the marital relationship with the expectation to discover her own identity. Instead, she was made subservient to her husband's wishes. The speaker compares herself to a swallow. As you read the poem, it begins with that. The speaker compares herself to a swallow who was tamed by her husband to fit into a routine of drab domesticity. She was lured into a passionate and spontaneous relationship, but ultimately what it came down to was a mere repetition of drab 
dull domesticity. No trace of love that she expected is felt by her now. Rather, what remains is the stale smell of a toxic relationship. Love appeared to her as Narcissus, and Narcissus here stands for the male ego. In her poem, The Looking Glass, she advises women to gift their everything to the men they love. The language she uses is daringly frank. The poem begins with a note of caution to women. See the poem, I have quoted it in parts because I'll be using these parts. The poem begins with this, getting a man to love you is easy. Only be honest about your wants as woman. The woman while loving a man must not surrender her individuality. Her identity as a woman, she should always remember. In the lines that follow, she portrays women in sexual stereotypes, equating women with passivity and weakness, while the male is represented as strong and active. See the lines? Admit your admiration. Notice the perfection of his limbs, his eyes reddening under the shower, the shy walk across the bathroom floor, dropping towels, and the jerky way he urinates, all the fond details that make him male and your only man. But there is a note of irony which pervades the entire poem, particularly when she says, your only man. In love, the body is not the ultimate. She must aspire something beyond the endless female hunger. This phrase is used in the poem, the endless female hunger. Well, the acceptance of male domination in patriarchal society is revealed to words like gift him all, gift him what makes he woman. The sad consequence of blind submission to the husband may rob the woman of her independence, which may incapacitate her in leading a single life in the absence of her husband. The last few lines confirm this note of irony as these lines point to the ultimate fate of those women who let themselves submit to male desires meekly and without any protest. I quote the last lines, a living without life when you move around meeting strangers with your eyes that give up their search with ears that hear only his last voice calling out your name and your body which once under his touch had gleamed like burnished brush now drab and destitute. The tone here is one of resignation and despair. Women may have to face, even after satisfying the desire of the males, destitution and despair. If they are not aware of the inner spiritual needs, which may sustain them when faced with a life without a male beside them. In another of her poem, The Stone Age, she calls her husband an old fat spider who weaves round her a mesh or a net from which there is perhaps no escape. The concluding part of the poem is an angry outburst to make her readers know her repugnance for a relationship which is all about the husband's fleshly appetites. I quote this poem and I read out the last or third stanza first and then the second stanza. Ask me, this is the last stanza or the third stanza, ask me everybody Ask me what he sees in me. Ask me why he is called a lion, a libertine. Ask me why his hand sways like a hooded snake before it clasps my pubis. Ask me why, like a great tree felled, he slumps against my breasts and slips. Ask me why life is short and love is shorter still. Ask me what is bliss and what its price. The pain, the agony at the end of the poem is unmistakable. The emotional aridity in the speaker's marital life often encouraged her to enjoy the company of people of her own age. In the same poem, she talks about her secret sexual escapades in order to enjoy the pleasure of love. I go to the earlier stanza, the second stanza. You can see this. When you leave, I drive my blue battered car along the <coughs> bluer sea. I run up 
the 40 noisy steps to knock at another's door through peepholes the neighbors watch they watch me come and go like rain the extramarital relationship that she speaks of in these lines is also talked about in her autobiography my story it is true that she didn't get the kind of warmth she should have received from her husband in the early years of her marriage and she admits quote unquote i always wanted love and if you don't get it within your home you stray a little in poem after poem thus focuses on the theme of sexual love and to her if such love fails to transcend the physical plane it cannot offer the emotional sustenance which she aspired for. In her poem, The Suicide, she speaks of the mutuality between body and soul. The poem begins thus. Bereft of soul, my body shall be bare. Bereft of body, my soul shall be bare. So the chiasmus speaks of the realization of the speaker who feels tired posing and pretending happiness as a married woman. She says in the same poem later, see the lines, I must pose, I must pretend, I must act the role of happy woman, happy wife. Kamla Das speaks uninhibitedly about her sex experiences. She highlights the male's lust for the female flesh in her poems. But what surprises the reader is that Knowing full well about this attitude of the male world, she continued to flaunt her flamboyant lust. I quote from her own words from the poem Fricks. She continued to flaunt her flamboyant lust, as she points out in the Fricks. Perhaps she adopted this ostentatious so of female body as a strategy to subordinate the male and ultimately making him love her. And certainly there is no denying the fact that she uses the body as a means of a very powerful protest. But the physical love must lead to something more fulfilling psychologically. Else, the heart would continue to be like, as he says in the freaks, an empty cistern. In the absence of that fulfilling experience, there remains a longing for love. And she talks of taking an escape from this world. The speaker in composition has come to the sea with the wish to take refuge because this would relieve her soul from its corporeal burden. She says in composition, all I want now is to take a long walk into the sea and lie there resting completely uninvolved. Now, <clears throat> in her poems, Kamala Das, if you read the poems, you will find that Kamala Das often engages herself in intimate communication with sea. The sea to her was a caring friend and a trusted shelter. The sea appears to be a rescuer for her. As she stands before the sea, the movements of the waves seems to instill in her a rare strength that could help her face the crisis of life. The experiences narrated in the above poems may or may not have occurred in the poet's life. But more than that, these words amply convey the state of women in Indian social system, where the unhappiness of women due to lack of love and understanding is not uncommon. In all her works, she had developed a voice of freedom and a female consciousness, which were hitherto unknown to the female writers of Indian English. Protest against the patriarchal system and continuous unmasking of the formal pretensions or the pretentious system became the main agenda in her writing. It's Kamla Das, who in her poem, Someone Else's Song, assumes the voice of million of people. You can see this. I am a million, million people talking all at once with voices raised in clamor. I am a million, million silences strung like crystal beads onto someone else's song. And the poetical title, as I've mentioned, is 
very appropriate someone else's song so here definitely she speaks on behalf of others <clears throat> so this is this i here is definitely a persona other than the poet in an interview with uh, pp ravindran which i have already mentioned in that interview which was published in indian literature issue of uh, may june 2009 thus makes the stand clear if i feel that my life is inadequate in some areas i try to feel that i try to perfect my life by adding things which may not really have happened see the her own words absolutely clearly she says i try to perfect my life by adding things which may not really have happened but for me they are real they have happened that is why sitting here in this armchair i can still write of mothers or of brothels many people come here and ask me whether i have ever been to a brothel to write about brothels my answer is no one does not have to visit brothels to write about them we often hear people talking about adding fantasy to reality reality is very drab it is as drab as white khadr right so <clears throat> uh kamla das uh she always felt that uh, women in general they have no space of their own they have hardly any active role to play in the family because the home is that of her husband the money that uh, is spent to run the family is earned by the husband the surname that the children use that is bequeathed to them by their father and even the wife after marriage in traditional indian system she gets the surname of her husband after marriage so all these issues in her contemporary society made the women women or made the women in general spaceless entities and in this connection i may quote the words of uh, gloria stenim which may explain the stance of kamla das i could not uh, get the original source of uh, gloria stenim uh, sh she is quoted in another book so it's a secondary source that i have used but the words are very appropriate here in this connection gloria says women of every race are the only discriminated group with no territory no country of their own not even a neighborhood in a patriarchy a poor man's house may be his castle but even a rich woman's body is not her own somewhere in our lives each of us needs a free place a little psychic territory very important words very relevant words now according to jayakrishna nair another very important critic of kamradas does his personal crisis go beyond or goes beyond her individual self and becomes universal our protest becomes a protest of all women suffering the same plight so the next quotation is from jayakrishna nair and the name of the book is cutting ages biology of experience in the poetry of kamla das nair writes kamla das as a feminist poet realizes the personality crisis of the indian women strategically perpetrated and perpetuated by the unbending patriarchal traditions and she violently reacts to these situations in the characteristically unrelenting indian socio cultural milieu where any surface commotion does not per percolate very easily particularly when it is against traditions and conventions thus makes a poetic revolt by way of introspectively pondering upon the unfortunate state of existence in which indian women conduct themselves so these words clearly indicate that thus as personal experiences are experiences of every woman our poems may describe incidents and events which might not have occurred to her personally as she has already confessed as i have already pointed out but she assumes the role of a common indian woman and narrates such experiences with surprising fidelity which seem which which made them appear make them appear as if they have happened in her own life now ike sharma in his article the irony of sex that gloss 
or the Tikud, a study of Kamla Das, he points out that Kamla Das was a representative voice of protest, speaking on behalf of the common Indian woman, much like Nair, uh, Sharma says in the same vein, these are the words he says, her chief contribution to modern Indian poetry is not only the stunning frankness she betrays in every line she writes, that is her chief distinguishing mark, no doubt, but also in making public a vast fund of agonies and information regarding women's psychic experience that lay hidden for ages in the private female sector. She throws the unholy sanctum sanctorum open and assess out in all caustic details in full public view. So with these words, I come to the uh, end of my second part. And now in the third part, I will uh, talk about the controversies or uh, the, the self-contradictory uh, revelations by the poetess herself. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, there is no denying the fact that uh, if one were to make an idea of Kamala Das's uh, relation with her husband from a reading of her poetry without having any access to her own words, in a number of interviews, they might think that the marriage was a failure and she had has been an oppressed soul throughout her married life. But by her own admission, her husband was the greatest support behind her literary activities. She might have suffered, as I have pointed out already, some emotional or psychological setbacks in the initial days of a marriage. But that the marriage turned to be a positive and productive one is clear from her own words. Unhesitatingly, she acknowledges her husband's positive role behind her literary career. She says, I quote, if my husband had not been sympathetic to some degree, I would not have been a writer at all. I know of women who decided to become writers or artists, but then changes their mind later because of the interference from husbands. Mine not only turned all away, but welcomed. He took some pride in my writing, which was a great help to me. Her utterances in her poems, as well as my stories, may be rhetorical and sensational, but there is scope to doubt about the confessional nature of such writing. As we have seen already in many of her poems, she talks about her dissatisfaction about having sex with her husband or other male partners. Such experiences often made her feel spiritually deprived. In Prova, in her book, The Waffle of the Toffs, a socio-cultural critic of Indian writing in English, published in 2000, comes down heavily on Kamala Dash. She criticizes thus for sensationalizing the readers with her sex-loaded poems. She writes, I quote, this is the book. So when the sex-loaded poems of Kamala Dash were open to the public, both reviewers and pedagogues went gaga over them with rave reviews. She became an unprecedented literary curiosity, marketing her salacious commodity with Ilan. From the traditional romantic stuff of Sorojini Naidu, the bedroom bird city, Badistri, sorry, was a real change for the hungering Indian male. All her outpourings bottom to the pelvic region, which readily becomes a talking point in a cocktail circuit. And then she is almost dismissive of some of Das's poems by pointing out that Das became overnight the paparazzi's dream girl so to say, one who preempted Sohade in verse, purveying the scarlet carnalities of the bees folk. Several of her poems are puerile adolescent fragments which should not have been published at all. Now, interestingly enough, when Kamala Das was asked about her being compared to Sohade, she denied such comparison. She, on the contrary, harped on the spiritual aspect of her love, love which and caters to the psychic needs of a woman. She told in an interview, Sofade is different. Sofade writes about probably what probably she enjoys. I may have written about love affairs, 
but I have not glorified lust. There was nothing obscene about love. My love was fashioned after the love of Radha and Krishna. And you know, there are several poems on this Radha and Krishna myth. There is something very beautiful about love. I cannot think of it as something horrible. According to K. Sachidanandan, Kamala Das's voice was feminine to the core and it is confessional in nature. The voice spoke uninhibitedly, as all the critics say, Sachidanandan also repeats this. The voice spoke uninhibitedly about woman's desire and in her poetry, one finds an unending search for true love. But Kamala Das did not like to be called a feminist and stands out against the Western concept of feminism on the ground that it is anti-male. In her own words, feminism as the Westerners see it is different from the feminism I sense within myself. Western feminism is an anti-male stance. I can never hate the male because I have loved my husband and I still love my children who are sons. And I think from man's masculine company, I have derived a lot of happiness, so I will never be able to hit them. So feminists for her, as he said in another place, they are a strident lot and they act as if they dislike men. men. So such contradiction pervades the poetry of Kamala Das. She had rebelled against aspects of female experience, which perhaps she had never personally known. When she was asked about the veracity of her experience of having several relationship with, relationships with other males, she did not quite deny it and added, I quote, I was a very young, attractive woman, and I don't blame the men who fell for me. I enjoyed it. That was the season for loving, and I was young, unquote. This is again from uh, her interview with Soho Warrior. And then side by side, she also points out that her husband was very understanding. She says, he didn't want to go to theater or for a drive. So he would choose a very harmless looking young man and ask to tell, take me out. No complications. It was not as if I was leading a wicked life. If I were out, I went out with my children too. We all had a good time. So she always talks about the hiatus between the body and the soul or the spirit. How far the spiritual indiscipline about which she writes in her poems was her own experience may well be questioned because she says that in her poetry, she often role plays. With these words, I started my talk that she mentions role playing. She talks about uh, manipulation. She talks about uh, wearing a mask, all these things. So she, in her poetry, often role plays. She says that I quote, sometimes consciously, deliberately, I would even adopt a kind of role because I wanted to write about such a person, uh, unquote. And, and in this connection, I would again uh, like to go to another essay. The title of the essay is a very interesting, Kamla Das, The Pity of It, which is written by R. Raphael, and it was published in Indian Literature, Volume 22. 1979, and the author points out that uh, uh, once marriage is not the same as one's experience of marriage. That's what uh, Raphael points out, talking about the way Kamala Das deals her themes uh, in her poems. He says he says that uh, once marriage is not the same as one's experience of marriage. What he means is what the author means. Raphael means is that the person who suffers and the person who writes about the experience of suffering are not the same. He concludes his essay by pointing out that Kamala Das fails to effect a detachment between these two aspects. And that, according to him, has proved disastrous to, the, to her poetic art. These are the words that I have quoted from the essay, has proved disastrous to her poetic art. So, but then uh, Kamala Das again says that uh, she, in an interview, that uh, she uses the device of manipulation and according to her, an author can manipulate the thoughts of her readers. Manipulation is not always a bad word, as she says. And then, as I have already pointed out, that the confessions 
as she herself says there are times a mask to hide her real life experiences so she is confessional and yet her poems are often miles away from being self revelatory what she experiences and what she writes are often hard to reconcile and <clears throat> perhaps she is able to maintain a facade of being confessional through through this dichotomy between her experience and her expressions i go back to sachidanandan's essay i have already mentioned k sachidanandan so in one in in his article uh, redefining the genre kamla dash published in indian literature in 2009 he regards her as an iconoclast quite uh, appropriately sachidanandan uh, regards kamla dash as an iconoclast and says that quote unquote it is safe to view all her works as part real and part fantasy as she was adept at genre crossing right so as i come to the conclusion of my lecture uh, i would like to just show you in uh, some more slides three four slides the words of joy surya das the youngest son of kamla das he wrote these words in answer to a brief questionnaire which was sent to him by dr santunu shah uh, a teacher now teaching uh, as an assistant professor of english at vivekananda college bartoman during his research on kamla das uh, santunu sent this questionnaire to him and i am showing extracts from this uh, 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 communication from this email in the next four slides just i will be showing nothing to say you you, you see you read and you go for your own conclusions the date of the mail is 25th may 2010 so the first question was how do you look at your mother as a writer is she a feminist so these are the things that we have discussed as a feminist or we have mentioned briefly about kamla das as a feminist as a confessional writer her relationship with her husband so this was the first question how do you look at your mother as a writer is she a feminist the answer was why for me should always remain the mother to us as a writer i can only say she was a completely independent thinker who wove poetry into everything that she did i don't believe she was a feminist at all i think she earned this since she was probably the first woman in the country who dared to call a spade a spade iconoclast definitely she is she was as sachidanandan points out the letter goes the, the answer goes her eroticism or the candid approach in her writing i think is just a small part of her depth she always enjoyed people be it male or female and was her inimitable happy candid self at every gathering for me she was certainly she certainly isn't a feminist the next question do you think that your mother mother's poetry is confessional and the answer came i don't think so while there could have been some instances which were true most of it was her unbelievable capacity to dream look at the words visualize and then translate that to the written word so that's why when kamla das says that manipulation is not a bad word or role playing or uh, wearing mask or wearing mask in, in in terms of metaphorically using term by a writer so these are i think uh, valid uh, assertions or valid confessions by kamla das because these are the words which you find coming from her own son the next question was confessional poets usually talk about their own experiences how for the experiences that she describes in her poetry are autobiographical in nature and how for are they assumed ones do you think that she used the confessional modes as a strategy in her poems indeed it was strategic to the extent that she needed to have her works sell see the world and we all know that when my story was published she was hospitalized because she was suffering from leukemia and she needed money and she showed the uh, entire uh, book before publication to her husband and her husband agreed that yes you can give it for publication so it was definitely the commercial purpose was there behind the publication of my story and as jayasurya says behind the poems also that was a motive because usually kamla das at one point of time said that poetry usually does not sell so indeed it was strategic to the extent that she needed to have her words 
work cell and she was considered a frank person. So weaving this did make a lot of sense. She loved and loved being loved, but which human being doesn't want that? We know her best and were with her most of her life and we knew each time that she did enjoy every bit of excitement in our readers when they responded to her prose and poetry. I guess that's what made Kamala Das so interesting. Very few knew the real Kamala and so one as much and, and no one as much as our father. So this is the most important thing to know and no one as much as our father. And the a, a last question that I have uh, used here. In my story, the picture of a husband, how far is it a faithful representation? She herself said in an interview, already if he mentioned, that much of the poor trial was not real life experience and one reason behind writing the book was to make it a commercial success. The answer is, my father was a man with amazing patience unbelievable love for her and loved all the work that she penned. For him, all this was sheer excitement and he knew her best. It's fiction indeed, but her style did make everyone think it was all true. That was her capacity to make believe like a Houdini would do. Bishmaya is time, each one potent and fiery, yet she lived a simple life. So. This is the extract that I've taken out from the uh, mail and I have used here for your uh, perusal and uh, to, uh, partly to draw your own conclusion as to the nature of uh, Kamala Dash's poetry. And finally, uh, before uh, I finally say uh, goodbye, the, uh, another, another quotation taking cue from uh, what uh, Jai Surya says, another quotation from uh, the book with which I started after confession. Another essay in that book by Yusef Kaminyanka, the name of the article is again very significant, The Autobiographical Eye, an Archive of Metaphor, Imagery and Innuendo. The quotation is rather long, I will not read out that. You can see it on the screen. Part of it I will read out. The poet wishes to share, this is very important. Even when the dialogue is part of oneself, spoken to a corner of one's psyche, one would hope that he or she isn't echo. For me, the speaker is often a universal eye whose feelings have been shaped by experience and or imagination and emphatic witness. And then I come to the last part. Although he or she may keep a journal, jotting down the daily mishaps, observations and blessings, cataloging glimpses into the past and present, straining to see future, the poem is still a mad thing. This is very important. So my conclusion is, I keep my conclusion, my, 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 my deductions open, but then my conclusion is that Kamala Das's poems are confessions on the one hand and mad things on the other. Thank you. So this is how I have structured my talk. And now it is up to you to judge whether you have gained anything from my talk. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for such an informative and enriching session with us. We are really very honored to have you among us today. Now, uh, may I request Professor Oyen Mondol, sir, Head, Department of English, Makura Christian College, for formally conducting the interactive session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Riyanka. Uh, thank you, Professor Shural, for such an enlightening, illuminating lecture as usual. So the floor is now uh, open for questions, uh, observations, any kind of interactions. Uh, you might post your questions on the chat box or uh, uh, you might uh, ask your questions yourselves or mute yourselves. The floor stands open for the interactive session. Please. Uh, I find one of my colleagues, uh, Tapos Dash, he has posted a question, uh, Faculty Department of English, Makura Christian College. Uh, Sir, is there a gap between what is revealed in every confessional poetry and the poet's own experience, or is it merely the feature of Das's poetry? 
that's his question sir yes yes a very pertinent question definitely because uh, the way i have presented it may appear that uh, it is uh, the unique feature of das's poetry uh, poetry definitely because it is part of literature part of art it involves imagination it involves creativity but uh, particularly if we talk about the american confessional poets because the term uh, is in vogue though confessional poetry was there if you go for the indian english tradition or indian poetical tradition it was there much uh, before but then uh, usually the term confessional poetry that has been in use since uh, the american group of poets popularized it and in their poetry i think uh, they are uh, they are their revelations uh, they are much more i think uh, truthful in terms of their personal life which in case of kamla das is not that doesn't mean uh, and i partly agree with you that uh, nothing can be incorporated other than personal history in confessional poetry but kamla das is a unique uh, phenomenon because uh, no one else in the sense that no one confessional poet i think self contradicted in this way that actually creates at times the confusion that actually creates at times the controversy and uh, we know that uh, she always enjoyed this so that is what i feel <clears throat> Thank you, sir. I think Tapur sir has satisfied you enough with his answer. Uh, there is another question from one of our uh, second semester UG second semester students. Although Kamala Das denied to be called a feminist, should we not consider her as a feminist poet, as she in her poetry speaks about adversities and dependencies of women in patriarchal society? Yes, yes, definitely so, definitely so. Because uh, the critics I have quoted, some of them has categorically pointed out Kamala Das as a feminist. So whatever may be her opinion, the reader is very important, particularly in case of poetry. When you read a poem, we form our own opinions. That is true of all literary pieces, whether it is a drama, whether it is a novel. But then uh, the appreciation in case of Kamala Das as a feminist, I think, is uh, perfectly. it perfectly goes with her because the concerns that she expressed that validated the claim that she was a feminist whether she herself uh, intended to be called a feminist or not that is a different issue but the issues definitely uh, enable us the way she has dealt these issues in her poems that enable us to call her feminist and uh, many important critics have termed her as a feminist thank you sir uh there is a question by alik mondol uh just a minute sir uh, i find there are number of questions okay there is a question by alik mondol uh pramod ke nayar in his book post colonial literature an introduction writes and uh, uh nayar is quoted Among Indian writers, Kamala Das was one of the first to move towards a feminist thought in a conservative and patriarchal society to discuss sexuality. Unquote. How far Das could be considered as postmodern in the articulation of the female desire? Uh, I, I I am not very sure whether she could be called. a uh, post modern poet but at, as far as her expressions are concerned they are very frank and i have mentioned that at times they are daringly frank the way she is using the language she has actually as uh, i have quoted uh i think uh, uh where uh, it is pointed out that she has broken that unholy sanctum sanctorum by the way she is using the language in her poetry the way she is expressing feminine sensibilities feminine sensibilities in her poems they definitely uh, go much ahead of his time and even when today we read kamla das at times we feel shocked because there are readers even today who if exposed to kamla das's poetry uh, for the first time although there are poets in the line so many poets for example uh 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 
uh, you can uh, talk about Meena Kandasamy uh, and, and other poets who has come on the line of Kamala Das writing confessional poetry. Still, Kamala Das's poetry, uh, I think, is quite ahead of my own time. And it is, I think, still ahead of our own time. When, even when we are living in 21st century, uh, we are yet not very open to uh, the freedom that we should give to the feminine sex or the, the female sex, right? So uh, I'm not yet, uh, I, can, I cannot uh, answer with certainty that uh, Kamala Das can be called uh, postmodern or not, but then definitely she is much ahead of her time and uh, her use of language, that is definitely something which uh, startles us even today. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from your good old friend, Dr. Shorbani Banerjee Mukherjee. Uh, <laughs> she asks, is the role playing of Kamala another she must have been compromised to patriarchy, as Asha Pulla Devi had also confessed. Role playing as compromise. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm referring to Asha Pulla Devi's short story Ubhinetri, where she had uh, uh, sort of confessed how women have to play roles and compromise their independent um, uh, thought. So, uh, would you say that Kamala's role playing was similar to that, or was it just another way of, uh, you know, presenting her uh, individuality? Yes, I, I, I would go for the second because uh, uh, Kamala Das says role playing. In the case of Kamala Das, role playing is actually assuming the roles of uh, many women who were part of the suffering lot. And at the same time, role playing is a way by which she can voice her protest in a very candid, in a very frank manner. So role playing in this sense is, I think, uh, not a kind of compromise, as you say that uh, Asa Devi has pointed out. Here role playing is actually a kind of strategy on her part to protest against the uh, patriarch or the patriarchal society. Hello. I have Hello. a question, sir. Yes. I have a question, sir. Yes. I'm very used to speaking to you. Hello, I'm very much, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Yes, please. Welcome. Dr. Mishra, please go ahead. You, yeah. You were speaking about uh, the fact that he is quite bold in his expression and he's a, family, he's a feminist. But do you think that his uh, bold expressions of some sexual images sometimes varies on a banality? Of art. Sorry, last part Hello. of the question. Banality of? Sir, uh, we are not uh, perfectly audible. So may I request you, sir, to post your question on the chat box? Okay, okay, okay I'm using this one. Hello, sir. Yes. Okay, okay. Now, you you? Yeah, please, sir. Please. Yeah. You? He's quite uh, old in his expression of his uh, feminist rights and values, but in doing so and in expressing his feminist rights, he has expressed some sexual imagery, which sometimes verges on uh, the sensuality. Do you think that his bold expression sometimes uh, makes uh, his art tougher as an artist? Makes her work as? Hello. Last part. Last part as an artist. No, 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 I don't think so. I don't think so in the sense that... Uh, Do you think that... Yes? I, 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 continue, sir. You have understood my point. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think that uh, yes. uh, the use of language by Kamala Das as she uses the language in a poetry, yes. that is in any way uh, diminishing the merit of those poems, whether you look it from feminist angle, whether you take it, uh, look it, look look at those poems from uh, the angle of a free thinker as uh, uh, or or as an independent uh, uh, individual, be a male or be a female. I think her utterances are very frank, and at times they are very disturbing. And this disturbance oftentimes is very hard to digest. So naturally. Uh, People at times they uh, criticize her, as uh, M. Prabha in her book she criticized her, 
violently. But I think uh, none of her poems can be regarded as something puerile and yeah. specific, right? So the language she uses is very bold, that to not used by anybody. And as I have pointed out to an, to, 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 as an answer to the previous question, that even today it disturbs us. If we are not exposed to this kind of poetry, reading Kamala Das for the first time, we feel disturbed to think more of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question by one of our students. How far is Kamala Das's confession and the confession of Sylvia Plath different? What are the differences between their experiences and perspectives about the women exploitation at the time? Yes, definitely. They were residents of two absolutely different cultures, absolutely two different countries. So uh, the difference is well understood. And as I have pointed out that uh, in case of Kamla Das, when this question was asked uh, in an interview, I was asked this question by one of the interviewers that, uh, why do you say that Kamla Das is an Indian variety in confessional poetry? So I stand by this because Kamla Das's poems, they are unique because the Indian scenario, which uh, if you look at the American scenario when Sylvia Plath was writing, Anne Sexton was writing, Robert Lovell was writing, that was a different scenario. Because uh, when they were writing uh, their poetry in America, the depression that was actually creating havoc as far as the American psyche was concerned. But in case of Kamala Das, usually what she picks up is the exploitation of women. And uh, in case of Kamala Das, as he has already pointed out, as we have discussed so many times, that she is not always talking of her own exploitation. She is talking about the exploitation of the Indian women in general. So Sylvia Plath and Kamala Das, that way, they are distinctly different, although both of them, they belong to the confessional genre. Uh, there is a question by Sridhar Gui, and I'm reading it along with uh, Navendu Das's question. If Kamala Das herself admits uh, that the I is not the autobiographical I, why are the poems called confessional in nature? This is by Navendu, and Sridhar asks, if a woman grows up in such a family where she gets all kinds of freedom just like a man, how can collective consciousness be applicable to her? Okay, I, I come to uh, uh, Navendu's uh, question first, and then I would request you to repeat the question. Okay, second okay. one, the first one. But the second one, as far as the second one is concerned, I, I, I think I have kept my answer open. Whether you consider Kamala Das as a confessional poet or not, that is definitely uh, up to the individual readers, their appreciation. But then the entire uh, gamut of criticism, Kamala Das criticism, if you see that, you will find that uh, many major critics, as I have quoted some at the beginning of my lecture, they have regarded her as confessional poet because definitely some of the incidents which she is narrating, they are actually real life happenings in, in case of Kamala Das. That is uh, beyond doubt. And as I have uh, at the end, uh, shown you in the slides, the reply from Joy Surya, her own son. He says that he does not consider Kamala Das as a confessional poet. So I think that is up to the readers to judge Kamala Das. She can be judged, I think, anew by readers of today. And uh, what about the second question? I said the first one, actually. Uh, uh, are you asking about Shiraza's question? Yes, or, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. She, she was talking about that collective consciousness thing. How yeah. can that be applicable to Kamala Das? Uh, if she grows up in a family where uh, she gets all kinds of freedom, just like a man, uh, how is collective consciousness applicable to Kamala Das? Is question points out that she got all the freedom during her upbringing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what no, no I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, Kamala Das was not allowed any kind of freedom. That's why she was given away in marriage so early, at the age of 15. And that is the fate of uh, Indian women in uh, many villages even today. Girls are married uh, below the age of 18 in many, many uh, uh, parts of India even today. So she did not grow up in a family which was uh, liberal, which was uh, allowing freedom 
and in an introduction, if you read that, I, you have definitely read that. So an introduction points to that, that she did not have any freedom and that's why you have protest, that's why you have rebellion, that's why you have revolt, right? So that's why it's a collective, uh, because she speaks on behalf of so many uh, innumerable Indian women, girls. Uh, sir, I'll be taking two more questions. Uh, one has been WhatsApped uh, uh, to my number by uh, Sanu Dangor, uh, a PG student of Bakura Zila Sharadamoni Mohila Mahavidala. Uh, she was a YouTube viewer. An artist can't be categorized, and if it is done, then the essence and the intention of the author gets hampered. We must look deep within ourselves to uplift us. Your opinion about this, sir? Is it? An artist can be? Cannot be categorized. And if an artist is categorized, as she means, the, the essence and the intentions of uh, the author gets hampered. That's what uh, she, she thinks. Yes, you, see, you think, and I think you think rightly, because uh, Kamala Das herself defies all kind of categorization, as in case of uh, her poem and introduction, she says that uh, I she was against uh, uh, being leveled against being uh, she was against being categorized in any way but then as far as uh, as an author to be categorized this is the job of the critics this is the job of the scholars so uh, they can't help it they can't help categorizing poets and writers so definitely <laughs> uh, that is a job which you can always uh, 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 talk against but then that is what we readers we critics or uh, the scholars do right thank you sir and uh... The last question is by Shudipto Banerjee. Sir, will you tell something on Kamala Das's conversion to Kamala Suraya? <laughs> there in the poem in Ya Allah, was there a hint of a love, a fantasy, or real? Uh, actually, uh, if you go by Kamala Das's again confessions, then she says that uh, Islam provided her with security. So that is something which I think is a very important uh, confession on her part. When she uh, converted herself to Islam, that was what she felt that she would feel much more secure. And as far as his, her, 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 her attitude uh, to Allah in that poem, I think you can uh, make a comparison with some of uh, the Radha Krishna poems, where basically you find a kind of similarity. So God has got no religion or the ideal that you are aspiring for, be, be, be you are Hindu or uh, you belong to any other religion. I think if you are pursuing an ideal and if it is a spiritual ideal, that spiritual ideal does not allow you to make a difference. I think uh, the love that she talks about, the attitude that she betrays in that poem, uh, if you side by side read her poems, on, on, on uh, Radha Krishna on, uh, or, or a poem like Hanashyam, then, then I think uh, the answer is very clear. Thank you, sir. There are two other questions in the chat box. Will you take them, sir? Uh, yeah, it, it is up to you because the I think is waiting. Uh, it is up to you. <laughs> okay, then over to No, no, no. My... You continue. I am enjoying it. <laughs> continue, continue. I'm enjoying it. Okay, Oyal, uh, Oyal, would you permit me to ask a question? For of course, of course, sir. Please. Okay. Uh, later, first ask those questions. No, no, please. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, there is a question by Oli Bark. My question is that if Kamala Das had such a supportive a husband, excuse me, sir, such a supportive husband that she confesses of having been able to. Uh, some problem. Anyway, my question is that if Kamala Das had such a supportive husband, some uh, some network issues, mm -hmm. uh, having a uh, supportive husband that she confesses of having been able to be a writer or a poet of such a dignity and freedom, why do you think she had so many sexual partners as we could find in many of her poems? What was it that she was protesting against by all her adulterous relationships? <laughs> Actually, she did not enter into any kind of adulterous relationship. Let me be very clear. If you read the interviews, she has categorically pointed out that uh, these were 
as I have already mentioned also, I think, partly in my uh, paper, that uh, it was far from promiscuity. It was far from adultery. Enjoying love outside marital uh, relationship, I think, can be the right of any woman. Now, when I talk about this kind of a love, this love is not necessarily physical love that she talks about or I am talking about. Right. So, uh, far from being adulterous, far from being promiscuous, Kamla Das, if she talks about uh, uh, this kind of relationship in the poem, I think that is a kind of protest that she was voicing, voicing, for, uh, voicing on behalf of women who actually remain disturbed emotionally in their marital life. Perhaps that was at the initial phase her own experience. She was emotionally disturbed, maybe because of the age difference, maybe because yeah, uh, the, 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 the kind of relationship her husband wanted to cultivate uh, did not uh, mat uh, materialize. So that may be one uh, 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 factor which was contributing to this kind of utterances. But then her motive was to point out that women, if males are free to enjoy, the come, if you go for uh, a reading of my story, you will find that she is talking frankly about her husband's being involved with med servants in sexual intercourse. So, but then again, whether my story, what she says there, they are true or exaggerated, whether she's playing up to it to borrow Bruce King's phrase, I'm not sure. But as far as her poems are concerned, the adulterous relationships, quote unquote, as you say, I think they are far from that, right? Thank you, sir. And the last question uh, would be put by my colleague, Dr. Nadu Gopal Mukherjee. Sir, please. Yes. Uh, Gautam Da, I yes. uh, someone asked about the difference uh, in the nature of confession between what we find in Sylvia Plath's poetry and what we find here in Kamala Das's poetry. And uh, here it is not exactly a question, rather an observation. In fact, Kamala Das, as you have also pointed out, that celebrates love, celebrates familial relationship. She celebrates motherhood in Jai Surya, the white flowers, in all such poems, she celebrates motherhood. She celebrates love and she also said in one of the interviews that uh, love is more there than anything else in her poetry. Whereas in, uh, if, we, if we go to uh, Sylvia Plath's poetry, we find clinical depression there. If we go to John Berryman's poetry again, even though he, wa he was a male poet, we know. John Berryman in his poem of suicide and Sylvia Plath in her poem, Lady Lazarus, speaks of suicide as a relief from the depression that they had been going through. And ultimately, both of them, John Berryman and Sylvia Plath, committed suicide. And they chose that particular um, mode, or rather, uh, that particular escape from life as a relief from their depression. In case of Kamala Das, we find not exactly that kind of depression or disappointment. Rather, she celebrates li life, celebrates love, celebrates motherhood, celebrates the conjugal relationship also. Now over to Gautinda. Yes, I agree with you because I also pointed out when we talked about, I talked about poetry therapy in one of these, in one of such sessions, uh, somebody pointed out about, and, and somebody mentioned about uh, uh, Sylvia Plath and Sexton committing suicide. But then <clears throat> in case of Kamala's, definitely she had unflinching faith on uh, this uh, love as an ideal. So naturally, maybe in private life, she felt deprived at times, but because she had an unflinching faith on love as an ideal, she also went to the sea, as I mentioned, that uh, many a poem mentions, Kamala Das is going to sea, and Kamala Das went to the sea, the speaker persona says in these poems that I want to take refuge in the bosom of sea, in the depth of the sea, but then she did not commit suicide, she came back. It is because, as I said, as, as you also say, that her unflinching faith on love as an ideal. Yes, I agree to that. Thank you, Professor Shural. Uh, and, you know, uh, on behalf of the department, I thank you for entertaining each and every question. And this question answer session has really been a very interesting one. I, I, I could see 
the messages in the chat box also be related there. Now over to my colleague uh, Moshumi Kundu, Faculty Department of English Mahabharata Christian College. Moshumi, are you there? Yes, sir. Am I audible? You are audible. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Sural sir, for such an uh, insightful. A thought provoking and engaging lecture. We acknowledge with due respect your support and solidarity uh, with our initiative to help the students and the researchers as well in accepting our invitation and delivering such a wonderful lecture that makes us think and motivates us to learn further. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now, thank you from my side, thank you to all. To the head of the department, the young head of the department, our dear Ayon. Thank you to Naru. Uh, Ashidda is possibly not there because, again, I can beg your forgiveness for mentioning each one. I have worked with them for so many times. Thank you, Shivu. Uh, so, thank you, all of you. And I also enjoyed this session because the questions are actually the test whether I have been able to reach out to the audience. So, thank you very much. And I welcome with you. Shukridida. Now you formally introduce Shukridida and I will be listening to Shukridida's lecture. I'm waiting for that. Thank you very much. Now we will proceed towards the second session. And now may I invite Riyanka to start formally the second session. Riyanka, please. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon and once again welcome back to the second session of today's International Web Lecture Series hosted by Department of English, Bhakra Christian College. Now we have among us another eminent speaker, Dr. Shukriti Ghoshal Sir, Principal, MUC Women's College, Burdwan. Before I request Dr. Shukriti Ghoshal Sir to go ahead with his deliberation, may I request Dr. Nargopal Mukherjee Sir, Reader, Department of English, Bhakra Christian College, to formally introduce him. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Riyanka. Thank you so much. And it's really a privilege and honor to me to introduce uh, my elder brother, Dr. Sukriti Ghosal. Dr. Sukriti Ghosal graduated and also post-graduated from Badwan University. He had also his PhD from Bakura, uh, sorry, from uh, the University of Badwan. Sorry for the mistake. He had his graduation, post-graduation and PhD from the University of Bardwan. He was awarded Man Kumari Jotindra Boksi Medal and Gopal Chandra Mojumdar Memorial Prize for securing the first position at the graduation level and at thereafter at the post-graduation level respectively. Dr. Ghusal was awarded PhD degree by the University of Bardwan in 1993 for his research study on the literary criticism of Oscar Wilde. Dr. Ghos, sorry, Dr. Ghosal served Ravindra Mohavidyalay, Hooghly, and B.K. Girls College, Howrah, as a teacher of English prior to his joining MUC Women's College, Bardwan, as principal in 2002. Dr. Ghosal also served the Department of English, the University of Bardwan for some years as a guest faculty. He has been recognized as a research supervisor and four of his scholars have already been awarded doctoral degree by the University of Bardwan. Dr. Ghosal delivered dozens of invited talks at a number of academic institutions of the country and also chaired academic sessions at national and international seminars or conferences. He is on the board of referees of two journals of repute. He has authored or edited nine books, including the prestigious Jivananondo commemorative souvenir Abohoman in 1999. He has published over 70 articles in English and Bengali, a few of these in well-acclaimed national and international journals. 
One of his articles on Tagore has been web linked in Wikipedia page on Gitanjali. Dr. Ghosal got national recognition as academic administrator in 2012 when he was enlisted as an assessor by National Assessment and Accreditation Council, Bangalore. So with these words, now may I request Dr. Shukriti Ghosal to start his delivery. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. At the very beginning, let me extend my heartiest thanks to the Department of English, Makura. Sir, sir, you are not visible, sir. Could you please switch your video button on, sir? Yes, I have switched on. Am I audible? Am I audible? Sir, you are audible, you are not visible, sir. I don't know, I have switched on the... I can, I can see Chukudira and I can hear also. Okay. I don't know. Please go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Let me extend my heartiest thanks to the Department of English of the Christian College, the principal and all the uh, departmental colleagues for inviting me to this international web lecture series. Actually, I do not have the intellectual height to make any presentation at such a prestigious platform. But I felt tempted when Warren approached me because I thought that I should uh, also uh, try to do something before I retire. Now, within three months, I will retire, and this web lecture series, webinar, as it is technically known, is a new thing that has come up during the corona lockdown period, I think. And uh, another thing is that since I am mostly preoccupied in administrative works, I uh, seldom find any time to um, go uh, update myself intellectually on a particular area which I pick up for discussion. Anyway, I thought that I should discuss Dr. Johnson's uh, London because it is a satire and these days satires are seldom uh, read, especially the satires of the 18th century, which are uh, which uh, cannot be understood very properly, successfully, because they carry, uh, you know, political undertow. I have, you know, let me begin with one, a few uh, words about how I have planned my lecture. Since my target audience is the uh, students, mainly the students, therefore, I will make a brief introduction covering satire and 18th century uh, theory of imitation, etc. And then juvenile, and then we'll come, I'll come to uh, Dr. Johnson's London. And then after touching a few uh, touching on a few aspects of Dr. Johnson's London, I will concentrate on the linguistic aspect because the main contention, my main contention in this uh, lecture is that you need a satire most successfully if you uh, are focused on the subtle manipulation of language in a satire. And so, the Sural. Professor Gautam Bhutteswar had just mentioned at the beginning of his lecture on Kamala Das that uh, poetry is something uh, constructed. Constructed, yes, whatever is constructed that should not be uh, mistaken for something natural. So, even when it is a spontaneous workflow, but there is some artificiality in it, and this is more true about Shatter than about any uh, romantic or other. Uh, modern poetry. Now, first, I would just uh, tell you that mainly the students that the 18th century neoclassical uh, poetic ideas can be summed up by four words. 
restraint, correctness, artfulness, and imitation. Restraint, measured expression of measured thought, is it, just in uh, opposition to exuberance, poetic exuberance we've come across in romantic poetry. Correctness, which we support is exposed the existence of external standard. And this again should be contrasted with the romantic spirit of challenging all authority, which was inspired by the French Revolution. Artfulness, that is the urbanity of expression, uh, which again goes against the, uh, rather uh, on the other side you have the spontaneity or naturalness of uh, uh, expression. And the last word that I mentioned is imitation. Now imitation is not just the imitation of nature, but imitation as the neoclassicist or 18th century audience of poets understood the imitation is uh, not invention, but it is an imitation of the classics. But this word, imitation, there is another meaning when we think of imitation of the classics. Now, 18th century theory of neoclassical view on translation, there are three uh, terms, metaphrase, literal translation, paraphrase, general outline of word for word translation, and imitation. And this imitation is where the structure and convention remain unaltered. But the structure that is borrowed from the classical sources, but the structure is filled with contemporary matter. Now, uh, Dr. Johnson in his life of Pope says that a kind of middle composition between translation and original design, which pleases when the thoughts are unexpectedly applicable and the parallels lucky. Now, this type of imitation, uh, I would also like to relate it to some, uh, no, one allegation against 18th century poetry is that it is lacking in a poetic, rich poetic imagery or variation of structure, etc. Now, uh, this we should keep one, we should keep in mind that Thomas Pratt, who was the secretary to the Royal Society, in fact, Thomas Pratt first wrote the history of the Royal Society, which was published in 1667. Thomas Pratt criticized the kind of figurative language which was very much favored in Shakespeare's time. He condemned it as kind of swelling of style and recommended that language should avoid ornamentation figures of speech and it should be brought back to mathematical plainness as far as possible. Now this mathematical, mathematical precision or plainness, this was the neoclassical ideal of language. Dryden once said, and this unpolished rugged verse I chose at fittest for discourse and nearest prose. So when we realize that 18th century poetry reads like prose, this is actually a tribute or compliment to Dryden because they didn't attempt to uh, make use of poetry, write in a poetic style at all. They avoided ornamentation. Now, when the 18th century is mainly a century of prose and satire, as we know, now satire perishes, uh, you know, in a society which goes to the dogs. The 18th century, let us say, brief acquaintance with the 18th society, 18th century society. Insofar as politics is concerned, it was in the 18th century that the modern form of cabinet problem, which is answerable to the parliament, that emerged in 1721 during the reign of course of George the First and Robert Walpole was the first Prime Minister. He was actually instrumental in the transition of the United Kingdom from absolute to titular monarchy. This is, uh, you know, a kind of a step ahead, though this was much disliked by many contemporary orthodox or uh, conservative uh, thinkers. Then, insofar as society is concerned, it was marked by some kind of uh, corruption, quite, uh, you know, understandable because our society is also. Uh, increasingly corrupt. Corruption, what kind of corruption? In rip of the law, Pope writes, wretches and so that jurymen may dine. 
lots of people merit is unrecognized appearance was valued over what and people could secure position by influencing the powerful people mammon worshiping or greed for money this was again another uh, incorrigible demerit or lapse on the, uh, of 18th century society and this was because the society was moving from an agri agrarian capitalism to mercantile capitalism what we may say that the aristocrats who had the landed gentry they were losing possession of lands and gradually the power was moving to the hands of the mer merchants and aristocracy to plutocracy uh, this is uh, uh, one aspect of 18th century society and psychopaths in such a society you know psychopaths was rampant and alexander pope in his uh, epistle to the terror but not and many other poems also he says how even poets they are looking for um, psychopaths and flattering the powerful uh, to get them as patrons you know he is grace i want to get from ask him for a place now incidentally patronic award which is loaded with meaning uh, you know dr johnson gives us let me refer to his dictionary where dr johnson defines patron as one who countenances support or protects and in the next sentence he says commonly a rich who supports with insolence and is paid with flattery this is uh, actually uh, the definition of patron now if society is corrupt how is it related to uh, satire satire you know satirist attacks the absence of norm as you know before that you should know that there are two ways of presenting life in art one is presenting realistically and the other is presenting in a different way romantically we may say now realistically the term realism again is to be used very cautiously in a sense everything even our dream is real so realism what is realism then realism is presenting life in a as i understand it in an unvarnished in a colorless way gustav hugo one of the 19th century french painters has rightly pointed out that the essence of realism is its negation of the ideal so ideal means a state where no lapse no demerit no defect exists that means all defects and demerits of society are wished away as we uh, uh, wish to be anything to be something seraphically free from all faults and lapses but realism is just the before the opposite where you admit or acknowledge the flaws and defects of society and the moment to utter the term flaws and defects you assume that there is a norm because defects and flaws are actually deviation from norm now that is why in satire always you have a norm before you and any deviation or departure from norm is uh, make the target of attack now norm again the term norm and its relation to uh, like whether norm deviation from norm is at all a, 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 a at all a kind of uh, defect in art or defect in on the part of individuals to respond to social uh, practices this is disputed minor map in the muse of satire rightly points out that tragedy tries to establish the inadequacy of norm so don't think that deviation from norm is always bad for example uh, in king lear when gloucester becomes blind he gains vision when lear becomes mad his sanity is restored so absence from norm sometimes is also a norm if the norm itself is uh, uh, to be challenged and satire asserts the validity and necessity of norm now when you assert the validity and necessity of norm you are realistic and you are challenging the deviation from norm now you can challenge the deviation from norm in two ways one is the conservative way conservative way as the 18th century satirists did when they assume 
that the structure is okay the deviation is to be chest right the deviation is to be corrected and the another way of a realistic presentation of the inadequacy of not is the deformative way that is the romantic way where the poet or the satirist romantic uh, uh, satirist or realist uh, singles out the flaws in the system and the flaws in the system are uh, you know pointed out because you urge upon people to uh, you know overhaul the system the system needs to be overhauled and you search for an alternative pattern as uh, you know you find in prometheus unbound or any romantic revolt against uh, life now criticism and satire therefore they are interrelated in fact satire is born of an uh, a spirit of criticism criticizing the society now again any form of critical representation of life is not satirical by default satirical it can be satirical but by default it is not satirical this is because criticism points out the folly as dickens does but not very sure whether the fault can be corrected but the satirist when he lashes out at folly when he lashes out at any laugh is confident of the efficacy of the medicine that he prescribed that means he is confident if i lash out if i uh, target somebody fire at somebody then i can uh, sensitize him to sense and i can also it my satire can also uh, um, um, help him correct his ways so criticism and satire then criticism simply points out is not very sure about the ability of uh, uh, con of efficacy of the medicine prescribed but satirist is confident of the uh, medicine prescribed efficacy of the medicine prescribed now satire how satire becomes art etc etc i don't have time here and i don't think it is also required because this is done by teachers in the class but two or three things um, should be made clear here the satire is born of anger it is anger become art and tone is very important in satire but satire is often uh, um, you know loses control over his animals and uh, hits below the belt but this is not those who uh, theorize on satire they think that criticism is good but restrict your criticism to corrigible faults that means the faults that can be corrected but for, for example if you uh uh i uh, mean find fault with somebody because he is poor but he or, or he is dwarfish in height or he is black in complexion then you are hitting below the belt and this is not uh, likely to be the uh, staple of good satire tone is very important in satire because uh, how tone is manipulated in satire that is to be uh, uh, kept in mind i will give you one example that sweet in modest proposal says a young healthy child well nourished is at a year old a most delicious nourishing and wholesome food for the stewed roasted baked or boiled but do you think that it is sweet who is uh, proposing so this cannibalistic proposal no he is actually finding fault with contemporary uh, you know policy makers who are responsible for the, the distress of the people and the scarcity of food so that to, the ironic undertone this is very important in uh, satire and students should be uh, careful of that another uh, point a uh, thing that is worth pointing out is the relation between satire and laughter you know that comedy the staple of comedy is laughter and satire also you just laughter but uh, you know how how satire is just laughter and how comedy is just laughter that is to, the, to be distinct one should be distinguished from the other let me just uh, make two or three use two or three words to uh, dwell on the distinction one is satire shames us but comedy amuses us then is laughter when you uh, when you are made ridiculous then you laugh and at the same time you blush but when in a comedy when you are amused you feel tickled so satire shames us comedy amuses us 
then satire exposes and comedy uh, not doesn't expose but it exhibits so satire exposes and fires and comedy just exhibits so exposure as you know that means something hidden something we don't want to be uh, made public but that is exposed by a satirist then satire satirist diagnoses like a doctor the fault uh, you know comedy diagnoses the faults that are there and like a doctor but uh, a comic writer a, um, a, a, a comic playwright for example or comic writer he uh, um, does that but a satirist actually uh, prescribes harsh medicine so the stroke of a comedy is like just the stroke of a feather but the stroke of a satire is just like the stroke of a so these are actually uh, uh, certain uh, points to be kept in mind before we go to dr johnson's london now dr johnson london i have uh, chosen the words uh, as my title tasting satire pure into johnson's london so dr johnson as you know he was mainly known for uh, as a prose writer and shakespeare editor he uh, his teacher as a poet is disputed but uh, he uh, is one of the three acclaimed satirists uh, of english literature especially of the neoclassical time dryden and the pope and dr johnson these three names are uh, uttered in the same breath now uh, dr johnson was so accomplished a satirist that bolts with one said that there is no arguing with johnson for when he pistol misses fire he knocks you down with the butt end of it so if the pistol misses fire he will knock you down with the butt end of his pistol so dr johnson seldom misses fire but if he misses fire he will knock you down in a different way dr johnson wrote a number of points but he satires men he famous mess mainly for his london which was published in 1738 and vanity of human wishes which was published in 1749 as you know now vanity of human wishes how much uh, you know whether it is actually a good satire or not according to ps eliot indignation or let's say hatred mal uh, the indignation lecture may make poetry but it must be indignation recollected in tranquility and eliot thinks that in london we have a pain indignation that had been presented by dr johnson instead of real indignation being recalled so uh, i think that in uh, when it is art when it is made into art any Uh, no indignation can be uh, real but it is when it is recalled and when it is let us say recalled in tranquility then uh, it must be uh, artificial anyway dr johnson did not have the great gift for poetic structure not did he because the 18th century model was the heroic couplet and they would stick to that the 18th century poets uh, all would stick to that and they uh, uh, would try to uh, come out uh, you know hit upon the exact word that will be perfection to the heroic couplet so uh, his poetry is very close uh, to prose but it, uh, when we say that it is close to prose it is not uh, actually an unacceptable uh, uh, let us say epithet to dr johnson but rather the 18th century poet should be pleased and consider it a compliment if you call that uh, describe that your uh, language is close to prose and it is not uh, marked by any figures although there are figures of speech and i will show how mainly the satirist uh, manipulates the language to uh, um, you know point the bark of his attack define the what the bark point of his attack Now, Dr. Johnson's London, as you know, is a. This is again another introductory remark, but uh, I will learn to the students maybe. But let me just uh, um, spend a few minutes on it. That Dr. Johnson's uh, London and Vanity of Human Wishes, the two famous satires of Dr. Johnson, both are uh, Juvenalian satire. Now, Juvenal, you know, was a Latin satirist of the first century AD, and he was. 
famous for the critical representation of contemporary Roman society. Now, Juvenalian satire, as it is said, it is a splendid mixture of dainty and stateliness, according to Johnson. But this does not help us, uh, uh, you know, understand what it is and how is it different from Horatian satire or other forms of classical satire. But Juvenalian satire is uh, marked by bitter criticism of contemporary institutions and characters, but the, the feature that distinguishes Juvenalian satire from Horatian satire is that it is to some extent pessimistic. It is a reflection on the spread of vice and depravity and spread of vice and proliferation of vice and depravity to some extent uh, makes the satirist as he meditates upon the uh, proliferation makes him uh, uh, to some extent pessimistic and it expresses savage indignation the latin word is siva indignatio savage indignation feeling of you know contemptuous rage at human folly you know, dr johnson's london who best illustrates the juvenilian satire i think that uh, uh, vanity of human wishes the vanity of human wishes which has been acclaimed by many uh, uh, writers and authentic voices that it is a better satire than london but london is also uh, one of the very accomplished satires written in english the Poem, you will under, uh, enjoy reading the poem. Now, one problem of reading London is much, it is full of allusion, and many allusions we uh, cannot right now trace out with the, with the help of, uh, uh, no, uh, without the help of annotation. And these allusions sometimes scare you away from the poem. But uh, uh, if you succeed in uh, fishing out the topical references, you will enjoy it uh, very much and you will enjoy it all the more if you uh, uh, can uh, find out what is universal in the topical, what is universal in the topical and this can be done if only you succeed in, uh, uh, you know, relating the allusions to your experiences of uh, present day experiences, your experiences of modern Times. The poem, uh, for the poem, Dr. Johnson uh, takes the you know, title from epi uh, the, the epigraph from Juvenal. Uh, epigraph, uh, Juvenal's Latin words he uh, translated into English for who, however, he still himself can bear the absurdity of this city and restrain his reign. As if the city is so incorrigibly. Uh, corrupt. The city is so incorrigibly, uh, uh, let's say, degraded that you cannot, uh, uh, you know, restrain yourself in and you have to. The only escape is writing uh, satire. It is only through satire that you can, um, um, you can express your need, your feeling against the city. Now, in this context, let me tell you that uh, those students may not be very much interested in uh, this particular aspect that Juvenal's third satire, uh, which lashes out against the extravagance, vanity, stupidity, bad manners, urban corruption, etc., etc. Now, uh, Dr. Johnson tries to follow almost every convention set by Juvenal in. Uh, uh, his third satire. So uh, I will just quickly, uh, no, it is very interesting if you read it, but I will just quickly acquaint you with uh, what is there in the original. For example, Juvenal uses a situation where a, uh, uh, someone is disgusted with the city of Rome and leaving the city of Rome. Uh, what will I do at Rome? I am unable to lie. So this city is uh, uninhabitable. 
So uh, this is the, it reminds me of the movie Yesu in Sailing to Bayan Cape Sail. That is no country for old men or Joyce in a portrait of the artist as a young man where Stephen uh, finds all with contemporary society and decides to leave Ireland. Something like that, that this is not a place for me. I find myself a misfit. It is difficult. So first of all, it is difficult not to write satire as Juvenal said. In Latin, Latin difficile as the most difficult in saturam non scribere, saturam satire non scribere means not right. The mystery is difficult not to write us. So, as if as the society uh, is corrupt and degraded, therefore, satire is the only form of uh, response, uh, poetic response that would be uh, thought of to this corrupt society. Now, what are the conventions? I will just the Parallels are fascinating. Almost every point you see, if you uh, can uh, trace the original, read the lines, uh, place the John place Johnson's lines to the originals. The uh, uh, Greeks, Greeks, the Greeks have uh, uh, invaded the city of Rome. Then uh, he talks about how uh, the, you warm the flatterers warm their way into the houses of the great and become their masters. And then uh, there are lines like, "If you smile, your Greek will split his sides with laughter." Then it is no easy matter. Anywhere for a man to rise when poverty is so Reference to poverty is there, and with good reasons for thinkers, the suspicion of having set his own house on fire. The allegation against contemporary Roman rulers that the house is on fire and they are using it as a golden opportunity to raise money from their, uh, uh, you know, from their flatterers or from the wealthy people who um, to whom they had meted out doors previously and similar references are there. Now my uh, point is contemporary you know, Dr. Johnson in this poem also, he uh, makes a few alle uh, allegations, for example, moral degradation. He talks about malice of exploitation of uh, masquerade debauches. You see, uh, masquerade, mark the word, masquerade debauches. That means you, in the, when you are participating in a mask dance, then you have to hide your face with mask and no one is sure about your identity and therefore you can uh, indulge in immoral activity in such a state. It is something comparable to our uh, young people who visit foreign sites incognito. Then in contemporary uh, London, the work, as Dr. Johnson alleges, work is unappreciated. Honesty is considered a deep a disgrace and lying uh, uh, lies the people lie not uh, they do not blast when they lie but they lie as if they are affirming a truth the poor are the common targets of attack high positions are owned by bribes and battered as they grease the palms of their masters and subordinates they retain these favors that is the insinuation is there that the master is the wholesale dealer and the uh, his uh, subordinate is a retainer. So uh, this type of moral degradation is there, but it is mainly a political satire. As you know that it is uh, to be read as a charge sheet against Walpole administration, because in Walpole administration, as Dr. Johnson points out, there was absence of integrity, there was a withering of values from uh, politics, 
corruption was there. That means you uh, did, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, you, you, you dole out favor to uh, uh, people, uh, appeasement as you call it, like uh, the word appeasement, which is very common in our time. Robert Walpole also brought uh, you know, support from many MPs by uh, bringing them under government payroll, we call it a pension. Opponents known as patriots, those who opposed it, they are known as patriots, and those who supported uh, Walpole, they are known as courtiers. So, um, he, this uh, to vote a patriot black, a courtier white. So, you cast a vote and a patriot, that is one who opposes the policy of appeasement, he becomes black, and one who supports the policy of appeasement, he becomes white, something like that. Then, uh, Dr. Johnson talks about this is also a very scathing political attack. I don't know how far it is true, but uh, he says that Orgilio seizes the golden pile as fire and hopes from angry heaven another fire. And so, uh, Walpole had a huge house, a palatial building at Houghton Hall. Uh, you know, and uh, Dr. Johnson says that, of course, this is an imitation of uh, Juvenal, but the, it is there in Juvenal. The accidents are welcome. If fire destroyed my house, then I will, uh, let us say, approach or people, my supporters will come, they will raise money and that, that will actually uh, be put into my account and will be richer and not, uh, let us say, I will not be beggared by the fire accident, but I will be richer. So any fire accident is an occasion for uh, material prosperity of contemporary politicians and Dr. Johnson talks about insecurity. Then Dr. Johnson uh, skates at or lashes at the controversial laws, for example, excise laws, the uh, ways and means that is being for raising money, then the relation between uh, England and Spain, and uh, let us say licensing act, or licensing act which was passed in 1737 to, uh, let us say, yeah, any play which is to be staged, it is to be uh, certified by Lord Chamberlain. That means uh, the play censoring the Walpole government will not get any certificate. And then also um, the reference is there with wobbling you not feel the license state. Now, uh, compromise of national interest. So Walpole was, which uh, was that Walpole uh, compromised the national interest. Something like in our time when you say that the tension, rising tension between India and Pakistan, and we will support the government if the government says that national interest, nationalism is to be protected. Something like that, compromising national interest. Explain the country's dear bought rights away and plead for pilots in the face of day. That means Walpole was uh, criticized for taking a softer stand against the, uh, against the uh, uh, Spanish lords. And then um, uh, another allegation was that national culture was under siege of France. That means uh, the culture, English culture, the British culture, the true Britain at the time of Johnson repeatedly uses. So this culture was uh, held under siege uh, of, you know, it was under the siege of France, dilution of national culture, you know, this may be traced to uh, some uh, 70 years back, you know, uh, in 1660, Dr. Charles the first, uh, after uh, his, uh, you know, death, the prince uh, escaped to, was on exile to uh, France and when he came back, when restoration took place in 1660, all his followers they were uh, taken from uh, France and the French culture, the French literary model became English model for some time. And Dr. Johnson here uh, uh, alleges that this dilution of national culture exactly in the way uh, Juvenal alleges that the Roman culture was uh, invaded by the Greek culture. Of sheep was artful, voluble, and gay. All that at home no more can bake or steep, or like a gibbet more than a wheel, as you know, gibbet is the gallow. So the English punishment system was hanging on the gallows, and the British, uh, French punishment system was 
uh, you know, pressing you down the wheel. And as if these criminals, they have crossed the channel and come to England, the English soil, uh, to uh, pollute the English atmosphere, at places the satire, the marks of xenophobia, but the tropical references I am not much interested in, but I am I just uh, am interested in the unique way language is used in uh, uh, this satire. Before that, uh, let me uh, just uh, tell you that you, uh, you and and I, one uh, commentator on satire, has rightfully pointed out that language in satire becomes a code of judgment. Language in satire becomes a code of judgment. That means if you uh, uh, if you test the language, then you can uh, also guess what is there, uh, what is being communicated, what is there in the mind of the satirist. And language has been is manipulated in a number of ways. For example, I am giving, uh, giving a few uh, examples first and then I will come to London and uh, show how language is uh, manipulated in London. For example, use of sarcasm. Dr. Johnson uh, Dryden in Absalom and Equitable, for example, uh, comments on Jim Reed and says, In squandering wealth was his particular art, nothing went unrewarded but the sum. That means uh, uh, charity is always better than my journey. So if you give away wealth to people, then that is uh, uh, you know, to be appreciated by Dr. Johnson. In the last part of this, it makes the, uh, this uh, squandering very sarcastically present squandering when he said, nothing when unrewarded but desire. That means only the distressed people were not helped, but other people were helped. There are something like that. So this makes the uh, you know, comment very sarcastic. Then in satire, you make a uh, pseudo tribute and by uh, making use of disgraceful um, uh, epithets, for example, again, maturing dullness from these tender years. As Dr. Uh, as Dryden talks about uh, Shadwell in uh, MacFleck, you know, maturing dull. So maturity is to be attained, but maturity in dullness is to be objected to. So maturing, when Dr. Uh, Dryden presents uh, uh, shadow and matured in dullness, then shadow will must say that a monihar ama nahi shaji. So pseudo tribute or disgraceful epithet, this is also to be objected to. Then uh, another, uh, you know, very close to it is defamatory lauding. That means you uh, lord something that is, uh, uh, you know, you are praising it in Sanskrit, this is called bagos uh, You are praising something which is not to be praised. For example, if incompetence is lauded or praised or admired, then that incompetence of the person whose incompetence is being admired, he must be uh, uneasy with the compliment. For example, uh, Dryden again says, the tragic news gives smiles, comic sweet. So mute, the tragic news should inspire tears and the comic news should inspire laughter. But the, just the opposite happens, the tragic news gives smiles the comic sleep. Another figure of speech which is used. So I, I told you that though figures of speech are not the ideals of 18th century language, but the clever way they make use of figures of speech, certain other, especially the uh, you know intellectually challenging, if not the decorative figures of speech, that actually uh, consists in the essence of satire. Dr. Johnson, uh, uh, another figure of speech is insinuation or a derogatory heat. For example, uh, we repair from artery vehicles to doors of air as uh, the uh, as Ariel or the Sif say in Pope's uh, uh, The Rip of the Law. What is being insinuated here? That we repair, we repair means go. Go from artery vehicles, artery moves, that means we, after our death, we leave our mortal body aside and go to the air. That means we rise to air and we have ethereal body. So, what is here insinuated? What is here being suggested? It is suggested that feminine frivolity dies hard. 
There is women, frivolity died, uh, uh, survives the death of a woman, something like that. Then another thing, retrogress is sometimes praised as progress in satire. For example, through all giddy circle they pursue, and old impertinence expelled by new. So you see, expulsion of impertinence is uh, a desirable state. But if you expel impertinence by new, old impertinence by new, this is not expulsion, but this is actually a substitution of one uh, impertinence by, by a newer, uh, new, uh, new impertinence. So this is actually a retrogress is presented as progress. Then another uh, way of uh, presenting it is the uniform scale of evaluation. So if there are two things you do not weigh R on in the scale with, uh, of gold. Similarly, uh, if, if two objects are being weighed, their values are being uh, a scale, then you should better, or you should uh, use two different uh, weighing machines. You should define two different scales. But instead of that, if one scale is used, then single scale for difference that actually that blasts the distinct blasts a distinction of importance in satire. For example, that classic line uh, line in uh, whether the nymph shall break Diana's law or some pale China just receive a flaw. So as if breaking Diana's law, that is losing chastity and uh, you know, breaking of uh, let's say China jar, they are. Uh, of same importance. So very cleverly, the uh, distinction of importance is here uh, uh, wished away, and this is how language works in Chatta. Now I will now trace how language works. You know, just for limit of time, I cannot go into the details, but I will show how Dr. Johnson also, uh, you know. Manipulates language or uh, let's say cleverly twist language to uh, um, sharpen the uh, point of shatter in his London. For example, in line six, he says, To breathe in distant fields a purer air. So the moment you are talking about a purer air, then you are insinuating that the air of London is polluted. So only when you, uh, so someone is going for a pure or what, so you are um, restless for escaping from this claustrophobia of London because the air of London is polluted. And uh, this type of insinuating, uh, uh, insinuations are presented past each glorious, for example, in pleasing dreams, the blissful age renewed. So the blissful age, the past, the past is glorious. In the present, the moment you glorify the past, then you are actually indirectly uh, suggesting uh, that uh, the signifying that the present is obnoxious, the present is uh, not to be accepted. Or say in line 245 when Dr. Johnson says a single J in Alfred's golden rain. Again, the golden rain you are uh, glorifying. So setting up the drab present with the glorious past. So glorious past is evoked very purposefully to set off, to uh, heighten by quality, set off the literal meaning of the word, set off is to heighten the quality of somebody through contrast. So to you set off by contrast the drabness, the sordidness, the, uh, you know, the let's say corruption and the pollution of contemporary London. Another way of uh, using language in London, uh, 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 just see how Dr. Johnson uses certain verbs and certain, uh, uh, let's say, words of action. In line 16, he said, and here the tail at all prowls for prey. So, prowl is a term, as you know, a, a, a beast of prey, prowling. So as if waiting secretly for the prey and jumping on it, and the pale attorney, the cruel lawyer. So he moves stealthily as if he is waiting for the prey. So a client, you are looking for a client, the client is your uh, prey. So the uh, 
predatory nature of lawyers since we are exposed by very consciously using a word, uh, 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 the, the word proud and prey. These are words which uh, are consciously uh, selected, cannot go with, cannot let us say, collocate with human beings, but according to human being, a lawyer is a um, man of honor, but they are, they have lost all their, uh, let us say, uh, honor and all their dignity and they are uh, behaving like beast of prey. And this type of using of uh, herbs that go with, uh, let us say, subhuman features to describe human action is cleverly done at other places also. For example, in line 59, Don Buffard Johnson earlier says, uh, talks about the French singers uh, invading the British stage with warbling eunuchs feel a licensed stage. So licensed stage, as you know, this is uh, all about the license act, but I'm here concentrating on the two, uh, two words, warbling and eunuch. Warble, this is a part used of a bard, when the bard sings softly and with a, a succession of constantly changing notes. Now, the eunuchs, the eunuchs, they, uh, the tenor castrato, they are as, a, as they are technically known, the tenor, tenor castrato required a male singer to be castrated before he attains manhood to retain a particular voice tenor called castrato. So the voice tenor castrato, in order to retain that, that's why they are called eunuchs, but they are wobbly. So this castrato is a kind of very heavy sound, but the uh, sound of a sound, uh, let's say, that is produced by a bard, that is not the castrato, uh, not comparable, warble is not comparable to castrato. So the funny, uh, let's say, contrast between castrato note and the, and the note of a bard song, this is actually here, uh, uh, the source of humor and the source of also the satirical attack. Then another uh, way of using language in satire is satire in uh, uh, you uh, make use of rhetorical question to plead your emotions. So pleading emotions, assuming a moral air, as if you are good, I am good and uh, they are bad. So uh, this, this type of moral air is often assumed and assumed by the satirist by using, making use of mostly the figure of speech we call, uh, let us say, uh, rhetorical question. Uh, so uh, sometimes even without making use of rhetorical question, you may assume moral air. Now, self notions is focused in uh, uh, London repeatedly, as if uh, the speaker repeatedly pleads self notions uh, in order to lash at the general degradation which urges upon his escape. So he must escape from London because he is uh, a misfit in contemporary London society. So uh, he, how does he plead notions? He said, who start at theft and bloodshed for duty. So uh, this is his uh, uh, position, but the Londoners are different. Well, may they rise in 79-81, he says, well, may they rise while I, whose rustic tongue never knew to puzzle right or furnish uh, uh, wrong. So he claims that I am not artful, I never confuse right with wrong, I never furnish wrong or present wrong as right. So this is, uh, a, a, that he is as a virtue incar incarnate. And he says, uh, turn from glittering right the scornful eye. So this is a way, pleading self notions, focusing virtue of the speaker. This is one way uh, of, uh, by contrast, you are presenting uh, the others in bad light. Then in uh, another way of using language in, uh, let's say, satire is uh, 
uh, is we may say that uh, uh, making use of words which are used not in the literal sense or sometimes uh, uh, presenting words in a way that they hover between the literal and the uh, existing sense. For example, uh, behold the warrior dwindled to a bow. Now the word bow is a French word which literally means handsome. The word, uh, the female counterpart of it is bell. Bows and bells as you know, uh, common uh, terms to describe the sophisticated, good looking uh, um, boys and girls. Now literally handsome, but in contemporary uh, society, this type of appearance came to be object of ridicule and the word came to be used uh, to describe or to signify the cops who are affectedly committed to clothes and appearance. So when you say the behold the warrior dwindled to a bow, so this uh, in Johnson's time anybody will catch it and think that the giant becomes a lilliput or the dinosaur becomes a mouse. So that, that is a degradation indeed. And this degradation is due to the, uh, let us say, use of a word which, uh, which is used as if innocently you mean the, uh, 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 you know, etymological meaning of some, someone handsome, but actually you are using it in the sense that, the, sense that um, uh, the pejorative sense that it had acquired over the years. Then Johnson, uh, again, to describe the degradation of contemporary land, uh, London, he uses word very consciously. For example, obsequious, artful, these are very uh, common, fawning, cunning nature. But what is interesting here is when he uh, talks about, describes the frame, his from the stage or booted from the pole. You see, his and booted, these are words uh, uh, we commonly use to describe someone uh, uh, you know, who is uh, not holding a high position, especially not assuredly about the uh, celebrities who are associated with the art world. But Dr. Johnson uses it in that sense. Uh, uh, rather to describe them how they are put it out of the stage and uh, hissed out of the stage. Another way, uh, time is running out, let me uh, come to the uh, you know, last part of how language is used in uh, uh, very innovatively and sometimes very cleverly, weakly by Dr. Johnson in London. He, for example, describes the uh, degradation and the, the immorality of the uh, immigrants, French immigrants who have come to London and invaded the uh, city of London. They sing, they dance, clean shoes, or cure a clap. Now just look at the word clap, cure a clap. The, uh, uh, in our time, the um, uh, clap has got a different meaning. And the meaning which Dr. Johnson uses it is, uh, has become obsolete in our time. In Dr. Johnson's time, clap was a word to describe gonorrhea, a sexually transmitted disease. So they sing, they dance, then clean shoes or cure a clap. So how language is used here? They sing, they dance, that is you are using some compliments to them. You are preparing the audience for a tribute, but then the expectation is belied in the second part of the line when you are making use of a subversive bathos, uh, you know, like you no know, louder streaks to pitying heavens are cast when husbands or lap dogs beat their last, something like that. Clean shoes or pure a clap. That means uh, uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, someone you are providing medicine for a, a cheap medicine for someone who is suffering from sexually transmitted disease. Then using irony, uh, uh, fasting moshia, for example, irony because no money, uh, these moshia, moshia is a term which the English counterpart of which is gentleman. And gentleman it mean, meant at least in Johnson's time, 
You remember when Adam did and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? That means someone who had passed property and from the revenue of that property you are living a life of luxury. But gentleman presupposes that life of Uh, sir, you are not properly audible, Dr. Goshal. Hello, sir. Sukritida. I think there are some network issues. Hello, sir. Sukritida, are you there? He has been disconnected, I think. Kritida, are you there? Okay, Let me check, sir. Not. Otherwise, yeah. I'll, I'll give him a call. Sukritida has just joined. Have you joined, Sukritida? Okay. Wonderful. Hello? Hello, yes, Sukritida. Yes, you are audible now. Sir, please go ahead. You are audible now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay. Yes, I have come to the concluding part of the lecture. Uh, now, uh, mock tribute is paid some, you know, as I told you, uh, I had this when I was discussing how language is manipulated in uh, satire. Still, to his interest, true, wherever he goes. Now, just see, mark the word, still means always, to his interest, true. So, being true is always a compliment, true to an ideal, true to an ideology. But True to self-interest, it is uh, actually an uh, insult which is disguised as compliment. So insult is disguised as compliment. Or for example, the way uh, the word supple uh, has been used about uh, to describe the French character. Supple gold was born a parasite. The supple gold, gold means the Frenchman. Now supple literally means uh, like leather something which is capable of being bent or folded without developing any creases or cracks. But when you are using this term to describe a human being, then you are focusing the spinelessness of the uh, French man who is uh, described as a supple gold. Or say uh, this master stroke of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sarcasm when Dr. Johnson says, uh, repeat the maxims and reflect each face. This reminds me of the uh, Hirok Raja, this is the uh, political satire program uh, in ABP Anundo. Tik Tina, Tik Tik, so from so to give that film. So the um, followers, the courtiers, they are reflecting the face of the, here the French admirers or the French, let us say, flatterers, they are uh, imitating, mimicking, aping the uh, manners of the uh, English master, but the master stroke it, when the lines, the way Johnson had uh, re, let us say, uh, incarnated the lines of Juvenal, originally these are actually from Juvenal, to shake with laughter air the jest they hear. So you shake with laughter only when you have comprehended the uh, joke, but even before you have comprehended the joke, even before the joke is all complete, it, it is yet to be complete, you start shaking with laughter. That is absurd exaggeration here. So the absurd exaggeration of juvenile, how it has been used by uh, Johnson here to shake with laughter, uh, the um, air, the jest here, to pour at will the counterfeited tear. So at the will of your master, you are dropping a drop of uh, a tear. And there, as their patron hints the cold or heat to shake in dog days in December sweat. You know that uh, 
uh, in um, shaking in dog days. Dog days are actually that time, 3rd July to 11th August to be precise, that is in midsummer. So in midsummer, do you shake a uh, shrivel in cold? No, you do not feel cold. But if the master said it is not hot today, it is cold, then Raja Sato Yoto Bole Parishot Dole Bole Tar Sato Moon, they will be shaking. And in December, so it, if the master says that it is hot today in December, then um, uh, you also sh uh, start saying, Yes, I am sweating. So this is how you always try to uh, oblige your master. And this is what the French had been trying to do to gain favors in England and this also uh, inspires the disgust of the speaker in Johnson's London. Then uh, two or three more things that in Satad we should uh, very carefully note of how register is mixed up. Conscious register mixing is one feature of Satad. For example, but here more slow fire all our slaves to gold. While looks are mercantile and smiles are sold. So, this reminds me so, looks are like commodity and smiles are also uh, objects which can be marketed. So, marketability of smile and commodification of look or appearance, this is uh, how uh, what Donson targets uh, in his satire. Exactly like uh, Alexander Pope, who says, like uh, of Belinda. Repairs her smiles and awakens every grace and calls forth all the wonders of her face. Now, another way of, uh, let's say, uh, manipulating language is mischievous or conscious misselection of diction. For example, when uh, it is said of Walpole, refund the plunder of the beggared land. Now, refund. Uh, Needing no gratitude, but uh, mean refunding becomes mean business if uh, uh, support is extended for government favor. Uh, no, this is how the word refund has been used in a very uh, uncommon way. And uh, hopes from angry heaven are other part I have uh, I already pointed out. And the last but not the least is the parallel uh, between Juvenal Johnson's recreation of. Juvenal, for example, Juvenal in his satire talks about the scarcity of iron to uh, make agricultural implements. Uh, agricultural uh, you say equipments could not be designed because uh, iron had become very scarce. Because all the iron was used for making a change for the criminal. And Johnson has uh, uh, modified that, and Johnson says that which hemmed the gallow and the feed supply. So all, as if there is a scarcity of hemp uh, because all the hemp goes to the rope, goes to the making of gallow. So this is how Johnson has very uniquely uh, uh, followed or imitated uh, you know, juvenile in his satire. I'll conclude by making two points. One is imitation as Johnson would understand it, or Pope would understand it in his Horatian style. It, uh, the existing the mold is classical, but the classical mold is inseminated with contemporary material in imitation. And Johnson is also using, uh, uh, let us say, Johnson does that in his imitation of, as Pope does in his imitation of Horace, Johnson does it in his imitation of juvenile in the third satire in London and tenth satire in Vanity of Human Wishes. Now, the point is, uh, what is the, why should we, uh, you know, uh, read it? Reading a political satire, how would you, especially a satire that was written some 200, 300 years back. Now, if you can relate past allusions to present day experience, then only your reading becomes successful. So, as Johnson had used the past mood, but fertilized it with contemporary material. So, you also keep the uh, satire when you are reading it, you just trace the allusion, relate the allusions to your lived experience, then it will become a pleasant experience indeed. And uh, as poetry is always something constructive. 
So if we can do it successfully, that is, if we can successfully relate the um, uh, 18th century allusion to our lived experience, uh, then uh, and also, and this can be done for this purpose, you can do it successfully if only you focus on, you shouldn't look for a dictionary or an encyclopedia or any uh, annotated text, but if you just focus on the way language is used, how register is mixed, how mock tributes are presented, how uh, stroke of bethos is used, then your reading will be most successful. That's all. That's all for the present. Hello, Priyanka, are you there? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for uh, such a thought-provoking and informative session with us. We are really thankful to you. And uh, once again, I request Professor Oymondo, sir, head Department of English, Bak Profession College, for conducting the interactive session. Uh, first of all, Dr. Koshal, we feel blessed. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for those illuminating insights on London. I have been teaching this poem three years now, and I have so much to take back into my classroom. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the session is uh, the session is now open for all kinds of questions, observations, interactions. Uh, so you can post your questions on the chat box or you can unmute yourselves and put your questions directly to Dr. Koshal as you wish. I already have some questions. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, am, I, am I clear? Are my voice is clear to you? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. audible. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I can't express how happy I am to attend your lecture so candidly explain the hard to understand poem, uh, London. Whatever. Uh, as you mentioned in the middle of your lecture, language as the code of judgment. And uh, I'm skipping the first three lines of the poem and I'm reading the next three lines. I praise the army but regret the thing resolved at length from Pice and London Park. And the next, next line, you, you mentioned yourself, to breathe in distant fields of area. So the fifth line of the poem, resolved at length from Pice and London Park. Is Dr. Johnson trying to generalize Pice and the contemporary London in this particular statement, from Pice and London Park? So what do you say? No, I cannot get your question well. Could you repeat it? So you are talking about okay, sir, okay, sir. Dr. Johnson uh, use of Pice and London Park uh, in uh, line 5. Your question is on that line? Uh, yes, yes, sir. He, uh, I am clarifying my question. Yeah, I am clarifying my question. Uh, from Pice and London Park in that particular statement, uh, is Dr. Johnson trying to generalize the Pice and contemporary London? This is my question. Okay. Now the point is, at the very beginning, I told you that uh, the uh, I talked about the corruption in politics, the rise of mercantile capitalism, the corruption, psychopancy, etc. Various forms of vices existed uh, in London, contemporary London, as they do exist in our society as well. So in every society, you find vice, and it is uh, not very good to idealize anything. So this is available everywhere. But you should also keep in mind that Dr. Johnson is writing a juvenilian satire, and he is actually, you know, keeping juvenile lines in uh, as his model. In juvenile, also, uh, uh, you know, ambitious the juvenilian character is about to leave Rome, and here Thalys is about to leave London, and therefore, and if you want to leave a town, why you are leaving it? So Dr. Johnson is projecting London as the, you know, as a vicious town. But let me just refer uh, to just the clever use of the word Pice and London. This is actually an example of which figure of speech. This is a, an example of the figure of speech. Hen dia dis. Literally, hen dia dis means hen means one, dia means two, and duong means two. One through two. 
कि भाई सन लंदन इज एक्चुअली विशास लंदन सो लंदन इज अनइनहैबिटेबल देयरफॉर आई वांट टू गो ऑन एक्साइल दिस इज व्हाट ही बट दो लंदन वाज अनइनहैबिटेबल डोंट थिंक दैट लंदन वाज दैट अनइनहैबिटेबल डॉक्टर जॉनसन हिमसेल्फ लिव देयर एंड लिव लॉन्ग ही डिड नॉट लिव बट ही इज एक्चुअली ही आर फॉलोइंग a uh, a classical tradition and imitating juvenal where juvenal's character ambitious is about to leave rome he is imitating that only so that setting he is using here thank you sir thank you we have a number of, we have a number of questions from our students let me put them to the uh, this is from mohurima ghosh second semester student of the department Sir, Thales was fictionalized as a friend of Johnson in the poem *London*, uh, who utters a powerful diatribe against the Walpole administration. Is he the poet himself, who, through Thales, expresses his own anger and frustration for the morally degraded London? That's the question, sir. So, uh, what is the question? I cannot get it. Sir, properly. is is Thales the poetic persona himself? Uh, the friend of dr johnson in the poem okay now uh, first of all let me tell you that uh, the pronunciation of the you know t h a l e s is thales not thales the pronunciation as i have gathered it from uh, sources of thales i pronounce it i don't know whether the thales is a correct pronunciation thales pronunciation is thales now for that thales is the poet himself obviously when It is. He is writing the satire. Anyone who speaks, even you know, all the characters. When we talk about Shakespearean characters, so Shakespearean, Shakespeare identifies with every character when he uh, writes the dialogue of for that particular. He identifies with Iago. He identifies with Imogen. He identifies with Mac Macbeth. He identifies with Banquo. So a uh, Thales. Thales is a. Uh, character and imagined character based on of course the classical character ambitious as projected and as presented by juvenal and as thales is speaking he is certainly so we shouldn't uh, let us say think that uh, let us say thales is uh, dr johnson is not using the voice of thales so the criticism is dr johnson's criticism and thales is the character and he is persona and dr johnson Uh, or can be identified with this guy. Of course, there are some differences. Of course, I don't. Thales lives at the end of the poem London. Uh, so, as an imagined character, he lives. But Doctor Johnson continued to live in London. But that kind of fictionalization you find in every uh, let us say uh, literature. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Tathagato Bose. He asks. How did Dr. Samuel Johnson influence or interact with the world in his own time and throughout history? Does he influence the present day? No, that is actually that can be answered only if you know if you have adequate knowledge of 18th century history and 18th century sociology. I don't have any claim to that, but I think that Dr. Johnson was a very Uh, outstanding figure in his own time, as you know, that uh, it is said that Dr. Johnson, who wrote the authoritative dictionary himself, forty uh, French scholars took forty years to write the French dictionary, uh, authoritative French dictionary, and Dr. Johnson almost did it himself. And he was, in fact, uh, he uh, two figures stand out of the 18th century. Uh, Dr. Johnson is uh, certainly one of them. He was a poet. He, uh, of course, he didn't write much English poetry, but he wrote uh, regularly Latin poetry, poet poems in Latin. He wrote, uh, let's say, he edited Shakespeare, and his edition of Shakespeare, though it had many flaws, but it was also uh, it created a sensation in contemporary time. He made elaborate uh, commented commentation on the uh, lives of contemporary poets. You know, lives of the poets. And Dr. Johnson was a literary figure, well acclaimed figure, like T. S. Eliot of the 20th century. So Dr. Johnson was a representative figure. But uh, how he has he influenced our? And in fact, you know, uh, only one thing I would say that um, uh, if you talk about influence, that 
In this poem, Dr. Johnson uh, imitating Juvenal talks of, uh, let's say, leaving London and going away to the countryside. And this theme of, let's say, um, uh, to one who had been long in city pent, that city, city is a penthouse and you have to live it. And this is a place of corruption, uninhabitable. Therefore, this is a motif which has been explored very, let's say, expertly and exhaustively by the transitional poets and the romantic poets. In that way, Dr. Johnson influenced the uh, junior poets of the subsequent centuries. The city, especially can't be contrast. Yes. Thank you, sir. There is a question by uh, another student, Hasnat Mitta. Sir, what were the initial reactions of the parliamentarians as well as the people, con people of Johnson's contemporary society after the publication of Dr. Johnson's London? If you could throw some light upon it. So, as you know, that a satire, if it is well written, and if it hits the target, then the uh, people against whom the satire is directed, they must be very furious. And suddenly, it infuriated the parliamentarians, especially the corrupt parliamentarians. But you should also keep in mind that this poem continued to be reprinted several times in Dr. Johnson's lifetime. In fact, the vanity of human wishes was a far, let us say, accomplished poem. But it did not run into many editions in the presence of its own time. But this poem did. So uh, this accounts for the immense popularity of the poem as well. And general people, they were reading it. And they must be supporters of Johnson or the, let us say, they were opposed to Walpole government and Walpolean administration. Of course, Walpole uh, in 1741 or 42. Or 43, you know, in the early 40, Walpole, uh, you know, he was no longer the prime minister, but uh, uh, succeeded by his, uh, another prime minister. Anyway, but the Walpolean administration, the presumption targeted, and the MPs might have been furious, but the common people, many continue, in fact, in Johnson's time was a politically polarized time, 18th century, you know, the Whigs and the Tories. And uh, therefore, if Johnson had many adversaries, he had also many supporters who uh, certainly uh, enjoyed the attack and who also agreed with uh, Johnson. So the next question is from Alec Komondon. Taking into consideration the genre of satire, we also know that Johnson happened to be a journalist as well. Could we consider, therefore, that Johnson's London is a venture in his journalistic approach which builds public opinion against the authority, pointing towards the miserable condition of the city of London through satire and topical historical references? In this respect, how far is it similar to Blake's poem of the same name? Uh, Blake's poem and Johnson, first of all, is it a journalistic approach? I don't think so. But then Dr. Johnson would not have used the classical model. So mind you that Dr. Johnson has been trying to, uh, let's say, translate in the sense of uh, imitate, imitating or imitation this, uh, you know, 18th century theory of translation. It is always Dr. Johnson has been trying to achieve that. So had he wanted just to uh, uh, let's say target the political adversaries in a journalistic way, he would not have used the classical mode. Second, so uh, London and uh, this London, London of Blake's, uh, the Blake's poem London, there as far as uh, I can recall, it is more of a visionary nature. That is, I told you at the beginning, if you keep in mind, that there are two ways of satirizing, uh, uh, you say, the defects and lapses of society. One is a conservative and the other is reformative way. In a conservative satire, you think that the system is all right, but if the system is that the individuals, they have, uh, uh, they are rotten. But in uh, reformative satire, which is the romantic type of satire, you think that the system itself has 
been rotten. So Blake uh, attacks the system rather than the individuals. Uh, and Dr. Johnson is actually uh, attacking the functionary who are running the system. And that is why Dr. Johnson's satire is conservative, whereas uh, Blake's satire is uh, reformative to my mind. Uh, there is a question by Shaborika Shinko, where juvenile a writer of a very subjective type of literature managed to keep his private life concealed. Ancient biographies found in the manuscripts of Juvenal are numerous, but also untrustworthy. Sir, my question is, does not Johnson use personal overview on politics in his poem London? Why is he considered the Juvenalian poet then? Again, I cannot follow the question. Would you repeat it? Yes, sir. Uh, where Juvenal, a writer of a very subjective type of literature, managed to keep his private life concealed. Ancient biographies found in the manuscripts of Juvenal are numerous, but also untrustworthy. Sir, my question is, does not Johnson use personal overview on politics in his poem London? Why is John Johnson considered to be a Juvenalian poet? Johnson is a Juvenalian poet. The first of all, let me tell you that no, you shouldn't, rather it is old fashioned today to relate the poet's personal life to his writing. Never trust the artist, trust the dead. So uh, there is a, uh, let's say, a gap between the poet, what the poet practices and what he says. This type of gap may be found everywhere, but dwelling upon those gaps is uh, uh, in, no, old fashioned these days. But secondly, Johnson is a juvenile, expressing personal overview, no doubt, but he is a juvenile in the sense that he is faithfully following the footsteps of juvenile. In fact, I didn't have time, otherwise, I would have shown that every particular thing, of course, she, uh, I told you that the mold is classical, but the material is contemporary. This is the difference. But the mold is there, and Johnson thinks that. The closer I can, uh, let's say, follow the mold, the better. Milton also did that when Milton was, say, uh, invoking the muses at the beginning of Paradise Lost. So this was actually the poetic uh, style in those days. Today, by originality, we mean saying something uh, new, invention. But in those days, originality would be measured by your success in how Closely, you can follow your original, but at the same time, how uh, successfully you can, uh, let's say, use it only as a uh, in the outline, but fill it with contemporary material. Johnson did that, and as he used the classical mold, and not only the structure that it is a satire, and not only the setting that uh, ambitious, uh, let's say, leaves and here Thalys leaves London. Not only that. But also, every detail, well, I told you at the last part of the lecture that in uh, um, Juvenal's time, Juvenal says that so many chains are being made for the criminals that iron has become scarce and scarcity of iron makes it impossible for us to uh, say manufacture uh, agricultural implements. And Johnson says so many criminals are being hanged that there is a scarcity of rope in the uh, say market. So this type of change has been done. But in the original, there is a hint. And Dr. Johnson just simply modifies it and fills it with contemporary ideas. Therein lies his originality. Uh, sir, uh, am I audible? Can I ask my uh, sir oh, oh. one observation? OK. Uh, sir, uh, this is Antara speaking. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Department of English, Bakura Christian College, for giving me an opportunity to do my first class after many, many years. I'm so indebted to all of you. Uh, I do not dare to question my teacher, but uh, it's just a curiosity, and I cannot uh, help taking the opportunity of asking Sir. Uh, sir, uh, London uh, is a point where uh, we have seen that the 
nearly as chapters of British history are time and again revoked. Yet, uh, but also, you know, there is also a flight to uh, an unspoiled uh, pastoral far from the greed and mercantilism that is also strongly preferred. So, uh, can we call uh, London uh, as a prelude to the cultural revival of Mary England thesis in the following century? where uh, we find uh, Hazlitt writing his essay, Mary England, in 1819. We find Mary, uh, Barry Cornwell's poem, Hurrah for Mary England, uh, being printed twice in the musical times. We also find uh, uh, Thomas uh, Peacock's concluding his novel, Crotchet Castle, with the same thought. And of course, uh, unnumbered uh, references to England as the mythical utopia in the children's book written during that time. So would you please uh, enlighten me on this uh, issue? Thank you. Is Sir there? Hello, sir. I think he has got disconnected. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, sir. So, uh, uh, thank you Dr. for raising a question, but I'm also sorry. I apologize that I cannot respond to your question, uh, with a, meet your question with an answer, appropriate answer, because I'm not familiar with the, uh, let's say, Mary England theory. So I'm not familiar with that, but if you would just rephrase your question in a, avoiding uh, terminology in a general way, then I may, I may try to respond to you. Sir, I was asking whether London uh, could be called as a prelude to the uh, cultural revival of uh, Mary England thesis that we find in the following century. Cultural revival of Mary England thesis. I, 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 I must confess that I am not familiar with that theory. Sir, I'll talk to you over phone, I guess. We need to discuss because I am also a little bit uh, unnerved at the moment. Uh, I would have been happier if I could respond, come out with an answer, but I'm not, I must uh, confess very candidly my ignorance on this matter. I have to identify. Sir, uh, we will take two more questions. Uh, one from an YouTube viewer, viewer Shantani Bojundar. She asks, Johnson judged his own poem harshly uh, and came to depreciate the genre of poetic imitations of which London was an example. Can we have the views of Sir on this? What is the question? Again, I missed it. Uh, she is probably trying to ask whether Johnson was judgmental on his own poem whether he judged his own poem critical, something like that. I also could not get the question clearly. Uh, actually, Johnson, uh, no, she, the, as he did, published the poem and after, first anonymously, and then he uh, published it in his own name. Therefore, we must say that Johnson did it want to hide it from the public and therefore uh, you are proud of this piece of composition. Though I also think that it is uh, uh, insofar as juvenile conventions are concerned, it is uh, uh, inferior to the vanity of human wishes. I have read both the poems. In fact, I read the vanity of human wishes way back in 1983-84 and I uh, this invitation also gave me an opportunity to read the poem again. And I think that London is just a good poem. And London will test as good, as good poetry if only you are successful in relating those, uh, let's say, issues just tied to issues of your contemporary life, your deep experience. This Thank is, you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The last question is from Vishwanath Mahapatna, another YouTube viewer. Uh, probably he's trying to talk about the universality of the poem. Uh, can the poem in any way be related to contemporary India? 
the corruptions in the poor area. Obviously, obviously, I run and I would ask all readers of the poem to try to relate it. I avoided them because it is a public platform and I shouldn't uh, you know, say anything that will create any controversy. But the issue of nationalism, the issue of political expediency, the issue of immorality, the issue of, let's say, uh, bribing people to get position, etc., et all the uh, propagation and let's say suppression of views, the license, like licensing act, you have also, uh, you know, even on social media, you are trying to control opinion. All these things have been part of our daily experiences. And once you can, uh, let's say, relate the issues described in London to issues that you experience in your daily life, then only your reading becomes more successful and more rewarding and uh, 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 you know, experience. And sir, I had a question which you have already answered. I was trying to ask about, uh, uh, you know, whether thematically the poem has many similarities with the transitional poems, uh, the city country dialectic that you were talking about. So yeah. I'm already answered on that point. Uh, thank you, sir. I now hand over the virtual floor to my student, Priyanka. Priyanka, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank Go you, ahead. sir. Once again, thank now you. may I request, thank you, sir. Now may I request Moshumi Kundu, ma'am, faculty, Department of English, Bakula Christian College, to formally conduct the vote of thanks. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, are you there? Yes, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Your audible motion. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I feel privileged enough to propose on behalf of the Department of English, Bakura Christian College, our indebtedness to the two distinguished resource persons today. They are Professor Gautam Buddha Shural, Professor of English, Bakura University, and Professor Shukriti Ghoshal, Principal of MUC Women's College, Badwan, who have been kind enough to spare their valuable time for today's lectures, despite their hectic schedule. On behalf of all the participants, I acknowledge with sincere gratitude and thankfulness some new perspectives in studies and further researches that they have opened up for us through their insightful and extremely engaging deliberation. Thank you, Professor Shural sir and Professor Ghoshal sir. I humbly acknowledge the participation of huge number of faculty members of different institutions, research scholars and students of Google Meet and YouTube Live. They have been patient enough to listen to the lectures with rapt attention and inclusive enough to interact with our regular resource persons. I take this opportunity to put on record the immense logistic and moral support that our principal sir, Dr. Fotik Boron Mondul, has extended to the department. Last but not the least, I would like to thank one and all involved in different ways in hosting this seminar, being our respected teachers, students, and the office staff who have been benign enough to extend all kinds of cooperation to make this lecture series reach its target. We will meet again tomorrow at 11 a.m with two eminent speakers, Professor Indrani Dev, Principal of Nisarani College, Purulia, and Professor Jibu Matthew George from Hyderabad. Please join us tomorrow at the scheduled time. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Moshubi. With that, thanking Dr. Ghoshal once again, we call it a day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.